Y'all good? You alive out there? (laughs) Good. Amen. Where's Destiny? You awake? (laughs) Oh, bless your heart. (laughs) I won't tell the whole class. The class already knows. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, God. She was up an hour earlier than she had to be because her electric was off yesterday and she didn't know. She thought it was seven and it was six. (laughs) Bless her heart. (laughs) So at 20 of eight, she was calling my house wondering why I wasn't coming to pick her up. (laughs) So she texted somebody, Miranda. And she said, is Pastor Dan there yet? And she said, I don't think he would be because I'm in my bedroom and I'm sure he's not here. (laughs) And she said, what? (laughs) Honey, it's only 20 of 8. And she went, ah. (laughs) But she had called my house and my house was busy because my phone rings. My my phone starts ringing about 7 because people think if they call at that time, they can catch me before I leave. So that's just a normal occurrence. So... Yesterday, I picked up the phone to a crying young lady, and I did the same thing today. So, life is eventful in the gospel. Amen. It's just good. It's good to have Jesus. You know what I said to her? I said, I don't mind people calling me like this and thinking of me when they're in these situations. I said, because they must see something about Jesus to call me, and I just figure it's a good thing. (laughs) So, we're having fun. I'm going to, uh, well, let's see. We're going to pray. That's what we're going to do. Not religiously either. Don't get religious on me. You won't. And I have two emails. I'm trying to decide just what to do with them. There, there are people that are online. One's from the Netherlands and another's a pastor, I think, in Virginia. And they have a couple questions and we might cover them. Just like we give you guys liberty to ask a question, we're deciding how to handle that over the internet. We won't always do this, but I might be able to do this just because of the nature of the questions. It might be helpful for everybody if I do them corporately because we'll all grab something from it because questions are good I love questions I'm not threatened by questions if we can't answer them we just say I don't know but it's amazing how Jesus wasn't threatened by questions they really ask him a lot of questions and usually their motive was way wrong right and he still wasn't threatened by questions in fact it got to a point where they just said we ain't asking him no more questions (laughs) because their motive was wrong they weren't seeking truth they were trying to expose and trap him and there's just no way to trap truth I was like, duh, <laughs> are you going to trap truth? <laughs> so he's not threatened by questions. So let's that's, that's just, that's just pray. Let's just ask the Lord. You get personal right now. And we're, 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 we're trying to get to a place in this school where we're really starting to talk about intimacy and communion with the Lord, but we talk about righteousness and why you even have a right to approach Him. Amen? Because you're not going to have a continual intimacy with the Lord if you don't see how He sees you. You get it? That's why we've been where we've been so far this week. So just begin to thank Him. He loves you right now. Just begin to thank Him that He loves you. He smiles on you. That while you were yet a sinner, He sent the Son. And your heart has no agreement with sin. I don't want sin. I want you, God. And I thank you. You've delivered me. Begin to talk like that to Him. Just open up your heart and declare your salvation to the Lord right now. Just open up your heart and begin to just get intimate with Him and thank Him for His personal love. That He knows you out of billions of people. He absolutely knows you. He has wooed you. Grace has touched your heart to make you even want to care. And you've responded to Him. And God, I thank you today. I have found favor in your sight. The blood of Jesus speaks on my behalf. The Spirit of God lives in me. And I thank you, Father. I am not self-conscious. I am Christ-conscious. I fix my eyes on you. It's going to be a great day. Because you're inside of me. And you love me. Father, thank you for it. Give me understanding. Continue to grow me into you, into truth. Grow me, grow me, grow me, God. Come and etch me, mold me, and shape me, and make me look just like my daddy. Holy Spirit, I yield to you. I just yield to you, and I say yes to all that you desire and want to do in and through my life. I'm just saying a very simple yes. Come and have your way. And make yourself known to me and known through me. Manifest your great name, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Father, we submit ourselves to you in this class today. This segment of time we set apart. We ask for great grace to pour upon it. That understanding would come in all our getting. Today we would get understanding. Let our lives be transformed because we were here together in your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
just simple, just to give you simple, just thought lines and ways uh, to pray and to seek God in a personal way where you're yielding and committing yourself to Him. Amen? Is that helpful to just kind of go into that line of prayer and just kind of talk our way through that? Because, you know, if I'd ask, if, you know, I'm not doing it to, because sometimes we feel funny about some people are quick to raise their hand and they don't care. <laughs> but I'm not asking, you know, who's new to pray in that, who hasn't really thought that way. But I've found that a lot of people don't pray intimately like that. They pray about needs, people, things they care about, things they need God to shift, touch, shake, which isn't a wrong, bad thing. They're all aspects and lines of prayer. But a lot of times our prayer life is, is mainly made up of praying about things, stuff, people instead of this right here. And, and you'll find that this kind of prayer right here will actually start to entail some of those things and you won't spend a lot of time praying on some of the things you used to think you had to. You'll just find things coming into a line a lot of times. You, it, it'll just, it'll just, your prayer life will change through intimacy. God just does stuff. It's really cool. Because it's what's on the wall up there. It's, it's seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. So you yield and give yourself to him. You accept his love and, and you accept the identity he's given you. And it says, and all these things shall be added unto you. There's just a great flow of grace when you're walking in agreement with truth. Amen? I, I know countless times in my life I would just think things that could have been prayer. I would just think them and they'd just come to pass. Like even in that day. Or it's just beautiful. You just, because you, you, your heart and his heart are one. You're in tune with God. You're in touch with God. It's just cool. Because if not, you have to be careful because prayer can turn into works. And now it's just all about you and what you're saying and what you're doing. And if <laughs> things aren't happening, you're doing something wrong. You ain't saying something right. And what am I doing wrong? And me, me, me. And it turns back on you. And, and then we get frustrated. And then we back up and say, well, I tried. And, <laughs> you know, people have gone through that whole thing. It's got to be something better than that out there, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just knowing God. So, good deal. Let me, uh, let me do this because I feel like I want to just do this right away. Can we just start to clear? Can I just hit these? You guys good if I just hit these two questions real quick? And I'm just doing this by faith because I don't know where this will take us because I really... <laughs> I really, you guys, have you guys gotten something out of Colossians? Colossians says that you are blameless, you're holy, you're blameless and above reproach in his sight if you walk by faith, right? So you are if you believe it. How simple is that? <laughs> so on God's end, he has no trouble seeing you through Christ and through the blood. And he's saying, how about you see what I see? <laughs> Is that sweet or what? <laughs> yes, no joke. Because why you were yet a sinner, he sent the Son. In fact, you want to you you see that? We quote that all the time. But do but you want to see that? Go to Romans 5 real quick. Then we'll, see, we're not even doing these questions. This is school. I get so pumped. This is so good. Romans 5. Man, I love Romans 5. If you love Romans 5, you have to love Romans 6. If you wrote, love Romans 6, you'll have to understand Romans 7. And if you understand Romans 7, you will feed on Romans 8. <laughs> and we just don't have enough time to go there now. But oh, See, don't just read Romans 7 and get confused or make an excuse for your life. Read Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 and understand what the whole letter's saying. They're not chapters anyway. They're just one big letter. Just a good thought. Let's just read here. Uh-oh. I'm in trouble. You got me already, Brent. You know just what happened to me, don't you? That's amazing. He said, uh-oh. There, there's a, I said, uh-oh. He said, yep, there's a therefore. I was going to say, let's just jump into verse 1, but there's a therefore. <laughs> so to know what it's there for, you've got to back up at least two or three verses, right? And if you back up to 24, 22, it says, and therefore, we'd be back at 19. It would give me a good excuse to just hit Romans 4. <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> um. Okay, he's talking about here about Abraham and, and righteousness being imputed to Abraham and that in hope against hope. You understand in Romans 4 when he was, you guys know that story? And, and, and you know, uh, he had a promise in hope against hope. He's looking at his body. He didn't consider that, but he considered what God said. And let's just jump into verse 23. Now, it wasn't written just for his sake alone that it was accounted to uh, Abraham righteousness because he believed. Okay? Isn't that amazing? His faith 
accounted righteousness to him. So even Abraham was righteous because he believed. So you're, you're made righteous through Christ and through his finished work. But what makes you righteous and know you're righteous and wear that righteousness? When you believe. How simple is that? So God's calling you to believe. Remember how we hit real hard in the beginning of school? The first day or so? This is already Thursday. We almost got a weekend already. This thing is flying. I had fun the last couple of days too. I really had fun here. Thanks for being here, man. I was just like, had fun. I was like, I'm so glad you guys came. I mean, I'd have had fun, but I had fun. I just, it was good. But you know how we said that faith keeps you from living sensual? Because you don't always necessarily feel righteous. You don't always necessarily look in the mirror and see everything God sees. Sometimes you get flashbacks. Sometimes you just kind of get caught up in an old yesterday mood or something. That's where you have to be the steward of your life and your heart and shake yourself out of that and say, whoa, and look right back into those eyes and get it straight. You might wake up one day and just not feel like getting up and not, you might have a job and you might not feel like going to work. You, you have to shake yourself out of that. You have to be a steward of your heart and your life and say, whoa, and, and deal with your perspective and mindsets. You can't just think that, well, I'm a Christian now and if everything was right, I'm always going to have motivation and desire and love the things I do and have a right perspective because everything's lined up. No, you, you have to work out your salvation with a reverence before God and know that He is first and foremost and He is Lord. And in the face of all these counterproductive feelings, you have to be the steward of your heart. And you have to walk this thing out. Right? And if you're not looking in the mirror and seeing what the gospel says, then you have to declare that and keep looking in those eyes. And you, just, and you get to a place where those thoughts don't keep coming and those negativities get washed away. Like, I don't... I don't, I don't I don't, have to, I don't try to believe that I'm special and God loves me. And I haven't done that for a long, long time, okay? I've just been goofy. <laughs> just He loves me. I've, that's settled. That's a line I've crossed, okay? Now, I spent a lot of time talking to the guy I saw in the mirror. I spent a lot of time closing that bedroom door and walking in and opening it and talking to what looked like the air. get what I'm saying I spent a lot of time living by faith and my faith has become my reality and that's a good day I'm like not conscious of faith right now I'm not thinking faith my faith is there's there's things that I'm pursuing by faith there's things I need to see more the manifestation of the kingdom it's more of supernatural restoration recreative stuff there's stuff out there that man we're going toward in faith you get what I'm saying but there's a lot of things about my life in the foundation of Christ and all that it's just established you let your heart be established right so uh, it's established so your faith becomes your reality so you're not waking up for 20 years trying to believe God's love for you no you started there and all of a sudden it's just like oh, of course he loves me <laughs> are you kidding I am so loved by God right so faith will take you there now watch this watch this it, it was written not just for his sake alone in verse 23 but also for us and it shall be what he's talking about righteousness it shall be imputed to us who believe so you're already seen righteous through through God's eyes through the blood of Jesus the provisions already been made for you to be made clean and holy and pure right but you only wear the robe and you only manifest the benefits of what's freely given when you believe isn't that amazing that's amazing. If you, if you glance over at uh, Romans 5.17, just skip a stone over to 5.17. You're right there. For if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance, who what? Who receive abundance of grace. Uh, le le let, me sh let me show you, let me express to you how you receive abundance of grace. Father, I thank you, you're so towards me. I thank you today there's nothing I lack that everything necessary to mold me and shape me into Christ is in me and in my spirit you're illuminating my understanding you're even molding my emotions my disposition the eye I look through your grace is sufficient for me and what I am I am by the grace of God I say yes to you I'm created to be a son and today I'll live like a son and I thank you that I'm in the family of God that's how you receive grace 
You believe it. You receive it. So you go out of your house. You haven't done anything but believe. You get it? And you go out of your house and grace is with you. Holy Spirit is working. Because you've taken time to just dare believe and, and enter in, you get thrown into a trial. The gospel, the faith you've released and the grace that have come, comes and defends you and manifests Christ in that situation. Or we get up, we're trying to be a Christian, we're hoping today goes good, we're praying grace over our day, we go out and boom, into a trial, and then we go, ah, oh, and we're, now we're running to the gospel. Hoping the gospel works. That's the way a lot of us have been trained up to live. Bump into the problem and turn to God. No, you turn to God, bump into the problem, and God defends you. The gospel's there. We don't wait till things get worse and make a matter rush to God. We wake up and make a rush to God. And when the crisis rises up, the gospel responds. Without you trying to apply the sermon that you heard. If you get thrown into a trial and you have to try to apply the sermon you just heard and become that. No, the word becomes flesh. And when you get in the trial, the word responds through your life. Because you've been in communion with God. Does this make sense? Years ago, the Lord said, Dan, I don't want you living crossroads Christianity. I said, I don't know what that is. I've never heard anybody say that term. I was sitting on my bed talk to me a lot sitting on my bed he goes I just sitting there expecting to meet with him so I'm either wasting my time I'm either loco or God's there <laughs> and the kind of loco wasting my time is two it's not it's one it's not really two things so it's either one of two things I'm either wasting my time or God's there it's that extreme I'm banking on God's there <laughs> So I'm going to sit there and just be there. And even if it seems like he's not there, guess what? The Word says he's there. It says he sees me. He's going to reward me. It says if I seek him, he'll be there. If I draw near, he's coming. If I seek, I'll find. So I am not going to let intellectual thinking take me from that place. Yeah, but I do that, brother. I mean, I've done that, and it just didn't seem like it wasn't working for me. That's what people say. That is deception. You're living by feelings. You're subverting faith, and there's no grace over your revelation. You get it? Yeah. So I'm sitting there, he says, Crossroads Christianity, and I'm like... And I heard it real clear in my mind. I knew I'm not thinking it up, because I don't even know what Crossroads Christianity is. And I, I said, he said, Dan, he said, many, many people live in a crossroads Christianity. And I said, well, what is it? I want to know. Talk to me. He said, to where there's a fork in the road. And you have to decide which way to go. He said, I don't want you to see a fork in the road. I want you to become the Word made flesh. And there is no fork in the road, just the way. And I want you on the way. And I went, whoa. And what he was showing me is you're going to bump into plenty of adversity. You're going to bump into things along the way. You're going to bump into opposition. But if you know who you are and you become one with me, who, the, who that truth is in you, who that becomes and what that looks like will respond in every time to where there's no stop, look and listen and try to apply the last sermon you heard pertaining to this. Like what do I do now? Because the gospel will respond through you. The gospel will rise up and defend you. Your perspectives, your mindset, your responses. Why? Because you've been alone with Him. You've communed with Him. Two have become one and the Word has become flesh. Do you get this? That's what we're pursuing in communion and relationship with God. To where I don't have to... You know, I use the example when you know, you're in a car wreck and boom, you're in a car wreck. It's now it's not... If you're sitting there going... If I'm sitting there and I'm going, and I'm sitting behind that airbag going, okay, they call me Pastor Dan, New Life for Girls calls me Happy Dan. I have to rejoice in all things. Time to be happy, brother. Time to be happy. They call me Pastor Dan. I need to walk in a manner worthy. I need to set a good example. Okay, thank you, Jesus. Hey, everybody. Is everybody okay? That's weird. That's shallow. That's surface. That's like weird. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm behind the airbag, it's really be a good thing to already know who I am and know that I'm Pastor Dan and Happy Dan and not have to think about that and not take a deep breath and try to manifest Jesus. But Jesus, how about already being in me? And let's just go with the flow. That's different than the other one, right? 
See, the other one, we're trying to surface this thing out and do it in the flesh. And we're biting our lip. We're hurt. We're despairing. We're angry. And we're putting on a Christian face. I don't even want those things in me because none of those things are in him. So there has to be a place alone with him where I get free from all that stuff, right? And that's where we're heading this whole communion thing. It's going to be really fun. In fact, one of the questions pertains to that. So, so you receive, I'm at verse 17 of Romans 5, so you're not confused on this because I'm jumping around a little. Much more those who receive, receive the abundance of grace. So I just gave you a little demonstration how you receive grace. Because anytime you release faith, grace comes. You're saved by grace through faith. So the salvation, the saving grace of God meets faith. Okay? You release faith, grace meets you. No faith, no grace. But is it there? Is it available? Oh, saving grace of God. But grace and faith go hand in hand. They work together. So as you release your faith, even in the change of life, like this question. Let me do this question right now. This one from the Netherlands. Wilbert, hey, we're going to do your question right now. How do you let go of being so self-centered and make the transition from trying to have faith and actually live by faith? That's a good question. That's that's an excellent question, Wilbert. The only way, the only way, because if there's any other way, it's your works, your strength, and your ability to do whatever you can do the best you can do it, and it still won't be good enough. (laughs) So let's just stop trying so hard. The only way is your communion and intimacy with God. You get alone with God and you acknowledge from your heart that, you know what, Lord, I wasn't created for me. I wasn't created to live self-centered. I wasn't created to be emotionally driven and, and live sensual and moved by every whim and everything and live by how it seems. And Father, I give myself to you. I'm a man of faith. I thank you, Father. I surrender my life to you. I'm not here to live for myself. I'm here to live for you and your great name and the world around me. And I give myself to you. And I thank you, Father, right now that your grace is so abundantly upon me. You're the one that rules and reigns in my heart. You're the one that orchestrates my emotions and redeems me from the fall of man. I am not a hurt. I am not a despairing. I am not a disappointed fella. I am full of joy, full of life, and my eye agrees with you. And I thank you that your love rules in my heart. That's how you kill self and resurrect Christ. It's in your communion. All I'm doing is releasing my desire. Because I can't make myself like God. But I can sure want to be like Him. And if you're so busy trying to be like him in your flesh, you're going to be a discouraged, backslidden Christian and say, did that, been there, done that, tried that, didn't work for me. And then you'll have a flesh excuse to be where you're at and it's all deception. Are you following me? Okay, because I know what I'm saying. I hope I'm not talking too fast sometimes. So you get this? So if I'm doing that, all I'm doing is releasing my desire to him and that's called what? Oh my goodness, that's called what? And we're saved by grace through what? So now that I'm in faith, guess what's in the room? See, this is what makes it faith because it's all supernatural. Follow me here. When I'm doing this and all I'm doing is giving my desire to him and I'm sincere, the pure in heart shall what? Whoa. So I'm sincere. I'm giving my pure heart, my pure desire to God. I am not going, yeah, but I'm so this, but you know how I tend to be this. And I'm not, I'm not contradicting and stereotyping myself based on my former actions. I see my former actions. That's what has me in the bedroom. And I'm going, man, I've had the tendency to be this, 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 and I know what this book says, and yet I'm this, 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 and this. Right? So I take all that knowledge into the bedroom and pour out my desire this way and understand I'm qualified, I'm equipped for this in Holy Ghost, and I'm in faith, God, that you're changing and sculpting and etching my life and making me like your son. So as I'm releasing faith, guess what's in the room? Guess what's doing the work in me? I might not feel it, I might not realize it, I might not know it, but the Bible says that I'm saved by faith through grace. So if I'm in faith, guess what has to be working in my life? 
Oh, oh. And if you live sensual, you'll pull the plug on faith continually and stop the work of grace continually. Are you getting this? Boy, this feels really good to me right now in my spirit. This feels bubbly and happy like this is really good. <gasps> We've struggled way too much. But the fact that we struggled isn't a total negative thing. It reveals that we do really care. That's good news. If you were just wanton, you wouldn't struggle. So build on what's good and don't say, oh, I just... No, thank God you care enough that you even have the capacity to struggle, but stop struggling and get a grip on this thing. It's faith and grace. Amen. You get it? So you can even build on the struggle. Thank God you have the capacity to struggle. It means there's a good root in you of, of sincerity and purity. You care enough to struggle. <laughs> See, but we're so negative and detrimental. And we, oh, I'm just, oh, I'm struggling. See, I'm a mess. I don't even know if I'm saved. The fact that you can even act like that means there's something down inside of you crying out that wants change. Yay! It doesn't mean you're a throwaway in a basket case. It means you care. God can work with that. Oh, He can. If He, if he sent His Son while we were yet sinners, I bet He's not threatened by your struggle. <laughs> why you, when you didn't even care... When you were deceived and lost in yourself, he had the ability to see beyond that. Now that you do care, he's, I'm sure he's bigger than your struggle. <laughs> you guys good? I'm good. I promise. Watch this. The abundance of grace. How much grace? Abundance. Oh. <laughs> abundance. It's more than even enough. It's more than necessary, probably. Oops, I knocked my little ear thing off. Hang on. Grace, come on my little ear thing. Okay. So you have to receive what? The abundance of grace. So you have to believe that God is towards you. That God loves you. That God wants to get His hands on you and fashion you and mold you and make a masterpiece. Here's how I always pictured myself going to bedroom. And I don't know if I've ever really personally shared this. Because some of this stuff's intimate. But it seemed like in the last school I shared some intimate stuff. And stuff I've never shared for the pulpit. But I always. And this isn't arrogant and presumptuous. And I've always been cautious to share it. Because people aren't ready to hear certain things. And they'll hear it wrong. But I think you guys can get this. But I used to go in and picture myself under a tarp. And I would see God as like the master craftsman potter and the bedroom was where he worked secretly and and I would get this picture of one day him opening up the door and this light shining out and him taking the tarp as the master craftsman and potter and just ta -da! <laughs> just me under that tarp ah! shining in the light of his glory <laughs> now that was that was on purpose a vision of mine going into the bedroom <laughs> So that's out of the bag now. So, so I'm out from under the tarp now. <laughs> but, but see, is that presumptuous? Is that arrogant? That's sure better than beating yourself up, talking yourself down, only seeing the worst in your life, and da 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 da, and then trying to get surface value and, and, and this kind of esteem and get somebody to just say something nice so you can go, ooh. Right? That's the rat race we talked about. No, you get a vision of what God's doing and you see your potential and you realize that even though you don't see what it is yet you're becoming, you know it's going to look like Him. And I would go in the bedroom actually with a picture and I would just realize that He's working on me. I'm a masterpiece of God. And in that secret place is where He does His finest work. And nobody realizes and sees the skill of His hand and the touch of his heart and his vision. But one day, whoosh. <gasps> see, see, I'm either or I'm right. <laughs> see how extreme the gospel is? I'm either way off right now, like way off, and need help, or I'm right. <laughs> I'm banking on right. Time will tell. Time will tell. 
much more those who receive. You've got to receive the abundance of grace. And the gift, the gift. What is it? Gift. Whew. Man, okay. It's a gift. You have to open up a gift. <laughs> yeah, is that what the message says? Wildly extravagant? Yeah. There's some, there's some extreme meanings to some of these words. But just, just relate to the word gift. Christmas, gift. Somebody hands you a gift. Come on. Even if you act funny about it for a little while, you open it. <laughs> but watch this. If I bought Hannah something for Christmas, because her mom told me she loves this and has been wanting it, and she's been saving her money, and I think, I'm going to bless her. And I go buy it, and it's a piece of clothing. It's an article. It's a jacket. It's a coat. And she really thought it was cool. And I totally rock her world and surprise her. And I hand her this. She opens up and goes, oh, what? And then she realized, Mom, I said, oh. and then, but I got it for her, right? So now she has the gift, but how is she ever going to receive the blessing of that until she slips it on? She's not going to go just hang it in the closet and never, ever, ever wear it. Would, it. would it do any good for me to get her that gift? And she says, oh my gosh, Mom, you, ah, ah. I say, and I go home and I'm happy because she's happy I'm blessed she's blessed it's just fun right and she goes hangs it in the closet and never puts it on come on that would be weird and it wouldn't even happen she's going to have that thing on yet today she's probably already got it on she's probably walking out of the setting with that baby on right ain't I something right no I'm just having fun but do you see you have to put it on that's what it means to receive the gift. It's not just thank you. Okay, I'm righteous. Put it on. And what's that mean, Dan? It means live that way. Live free from sin consciousness. Live from, oh, dumb me. You'll never get it right. You live righteous. You receive the gift of righteousness. You're the one that puts it on. And watch, you're the only one that can take it off. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Does he ever change his mind about you? No. Will the Lord ever look down? So he gives Hannah righteousness, and then he looks down, and one day she just happens to be struggling with a couple things in her mind or issues, and, and then she doesn't get a real clarity on it, and her heart's good and pure, but her mind's a little confused, and all of a sudden she takes a little turn in the trail, and she just takes a little. Does God say, Why did I even give you that code? Well, I, you know, I gave you that coat. I thought you just put it on and look. Why, why are you wearing this when I gave you that coat? Why are you even wearing this when I gave you this coat? Is that God? No. God's looking. Oh, honey, why are you wearing that when you look so beautiful in what I gave you? Oh, honey, no, don't go. Oh, I love you so much. You look. So, that is so not you. I know who you are. I know how beautiful you are. Just wear what I've given you, honey. That's God the Father, I promise. That's why you get convictions when you know things aren't right. That's why you think twice when things ain't going smooth. That's why your heart cares deep down in because God the Father's love is wooing you home because He knows who you are in the face of the little loop around the trail. And He knows how beautiful you are in Him. And He's a wooer and a lover. He's not going to... Well, I should have saved my money. I don't even know why. Well, Jesus, don't know why you spilled your blood for them. They don't appreciate it. No, he understands this stuff. How people get to see wrong thinking, do, do things they wish. Ha, he, ha, Right? But here's the deal. He'll never change his mind. He has judged her righteous, knows her potential, knows her destiny. That can never change. This young lady has the great privilege of putting on that jacket and walking through life with it on. And she's the only one that can take it off. The devil can, I promise. And God never will. <sighs> you get it? Come on. This is good. So if you do receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, guess what you will do? Reign in life. In what? In life through the one. Jesus Christ.
<laughs> you see what's wrong with me? I am pumped about this gospel. <laughs> see? But see, you got to believe it. See, you can be overwhelmed by life right now and you let everything else have a louder voice and say, yeah, whatever, brother, good. I'm glad you're happy. And even though you're feeling and believing and you've got your eye on all this other stuff, this is still true. And it's still waiting for you. You see the paradox? So what are you letting matter? What are you really believing? What are you giving your heart, your mind, your eye to? What are you giving your faith to? The way it feels and seems and appears or the way it's proclaimed and it is by the Spirit. Did you have a question? Did you? Yeah. Just, just say it and I'll repeat okay. it. Yeah. Uh, with this extreme truth of righteousness, it's just, it's so awesome and it's so extreme. And to share it with others, like there are some that I can just call and I'm so excited to share it with. And then there are some, it's like I know that they are going to be so not where I'm at and I don't feel that I'm graced to respond at this point so do I wait until I feel the grace to respond to their yeah that's a good what, what she's saying is she said this 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 news is so good yeah it's like I heard Graham Cook I went and I listened to him one time preach live and he said he said uh he said it hinges on fairy tale, the gospel. Oh, yeah. Hinges on fairy tale. And it does. It's, it's like sounds too good to be true. So her question is, you know, there's people in my life I know that would just embrace this. It would be good news and it would be like, oh. And there's other people that would, it would just, like they couldn't receive it and she wasn't sure if there's even grace to just. I would say good news is good news and you should sow some seed. You want to be careful because you love people or you've located where people aren't. You want to be careful to not project and just try to push the gospel on to people but at the same time you look for opportunity sincerely look for opportunity you pray about opportunity for doorways even Paul said pray for me that a doorway be open that utterance in the gospel right so you see your friends or the people that you're not sure would totally receive and you just look for little opportunities to oh honey I know you feel that way but here's what's been happening in my own heart because I remember feeling that way Think about what this says. And you find a way to open that door and continue to sow seed and water a seed. You see what I mean? Because if you just point blank say, well, they're not ready and they can't. Because the sower sows the word. So there's a place to put some seed somewhere along the line. And, and, and if it feels like that door's totally closed, and I can tell you there's times in my life where I felt like it was more of a prayer thing for now and looking for a window of grace, I've been through that myself. I don't think there's a right and wrong in this as much as a pure heart in it. Because some of us feel compelled to change our loved ones. And you're not going to find grace on that. Some of us, you know, we feel like, you know, now we get riding momentum and we feel like, hey, we're seeing something, we're all excited, and we come across it and we don't realize how we touch people in zeal sometimes, we don't season things with grace sometimes, we just want to go in and try to clean up our workplace or something. And that sounds suggestive to them in the sense of presumptuous, projecting, oh, you're higher than us, and that's why people have gotten that impression, because we've come across that way sometimes, and we don't even realize it. There was a time I, I didn't realize, I was saved just a few months and a guy at work and I saw a couple people healed. I saw a few miracles. I had a hernia that closed under my hand. I was four months old in the Lord, so I'm freaked out. What do you do with me now? I get a word of knowledge that a man needs a miracle. I go up and he tells me that in the morning he's going for a double mesh wire through his abdomen wall because his whole muscles are degenerating and he's blowing out with hernias and he has one now as big as an orange under his belt. And in the morning they're going to engraft a, a, a double mesh thing to hold his stomach together and I walked up to him he didn't walk up to me I'm four months saved right <laughs> I had no teaching on the word of knowledge I had never been in a class on the supernatural but I had been in my bedroom with Jesus and I've read in my Bible he gives gifts to men it, it, I don't need a name for it I don't even need to know how it works I just need to know he loves me and I'm right in him and the kingdom's in me and whatever that means it's going to bear fruit it's going to happen See, it's that simple. It's a pretty childlike thing. So I'm just, I just see this guy and I said, hey, I feel like you really need a touch from the Lord, like a miracle, like you need God to move on your behalf right now, like right now. And he said, that's amazing. You're asking me that. Tomorrow morning, bam, bam, bam. I said, man, let's pray. I said, where is this thing at? He said, it's right here. He said, listen, I read if I lay my hands on the sick and I know we're guys and it's only right around your belt line. Would that offend you? Could I? He said, no, that's all right. And when he moved his belt line down, it just went, poof. everything inside was pushing. It was like being held by a membrane of skin. 
because there was nothing, nothing there. And I cupped my hand around it and began to pray and it went and went closed. And he went down on the ground, bawling. When he went to the doctor the next day, they couldn't even find a seam and there was nothing wrong with his muscle wall. <laughs> now watch, now watch. I'm four months saved. I got more people telling me after the first guy got healed at three months old, the Lord, well, you better be careful with that. Well, you need to know God doesn't always heal. And the one first comment out of some Christian in my life said, well, now you got to be careful, Dan, because the devil can heal. All that stuff was just shooting out. Why? Because the devil was so freaked out and so afraid that I'm getting a hold of this. I'm innocent. I'm fresh. I'm young. I'm on fire. My heart's alive. And he's going, man, we better quench this thing and wrap religion over it real quick. Get some people that seem to have wisdom in his life and tone him down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I feel pretty happy because I think I survived some of that. <laughs> Watch. Put yourself in my shoes, poor fella. I just saw two miracles in two months and I'm barely saved. It's time-wise barely saved. I'm totally saved. Time-wise barely saved. I put my hand on a hernia and he goes what do you do with me now <laughs> you get what I'm saying yeah. so now I'm what I'm ready yeah. I'm excited I'm pumped listen I got to get back to something here there was a point I was making but I don't think it's, it, it matters anymore I think the point was made watch this I got to get back to this I gotta see if we do this one too oh god Back up to Romans 5, 1. Well, we're at verse 24 of Romans 4. See, this is also imputed to us if we believe. He raised us up. He raised us up. And I hope I answered your question just enough, hon. It, there's no real right or wrong with it. You make sure your heart's pure and your motive's clean in what you do. And God graces pure motives. I said this the other day in school. I could come and tell Jenny something and be purely, truly motivated in love and say it totally for her sake and be very raw and real with my words and, and stark and uncovered and straight. You know what I'm saying? And be real pure in it and have love and there'll be grace to attend it and you'd be amazed. I live that way actually because I don't like to beat around the bush stuff and, and love gives you a great permission to be real. It like doesn't have boundaries. It's, it's like there's no really rules wrapped around love. Like you can go to, I'm not against seminaries, but from what I understand from people that have been taught things in seminary, there's a list of do's and don'ts. And love doesn't understand that list. It just doesn't. I could tell you some crazy stories. On the flip side, I could come and tell Jenny the very same words from a different heart motivation. And I'm the one found in sin. Because my motive isn't even love. It's just maybe because she's wrong, trying to set her straight. I have a need in my life to be right. Or whatever. And it doesn't carry grace. See, you can say something to your children for their sake because you love them and you see where this is going to take them and they're going to suffer pain that they don't need to and you're trying to father them or mother them and you say something and it's sharp, it's straight, it's corrective and adjusted but from your heart and your motive you're saying it solely because you could cry for them because you see where this is trying to take them or you can turn and say the exact same words because you're frustrated and cause harm to your child. The exact same words. Because God attends truth and He attends love. Truth, love speaks the, the truth. We speak the truth in love. And when you're speaking the truth in love, God's on that. It's not about being right. Being right doesn't make it right. Sometimes being right can make you wrong because you're too busy being right and you forget righteousness. Are you, are you okay with that? Or is that too Christianese? Did you get that? Sometimes we're so busy being right and, and we see what's wrong so we're so busy being right and setting people straight and being right that, it, that we make it wrong because we forget righteousness. We forget the value of the person, the heart of the person, the sensitivity toward the person and the motive and why we have a need to say anything in the first place. 
We're not saying anything just because we've located somebody's wrong. We're saying something because of the value of their life and we love them. And if that isn't why you're speaking, don't speak. <laughs> so that's a real one we've really got to learn right there. Because we get religious and proud and knowledge puffs us up. And we read our Bible and we say, well, why are you doing that? The Word says, well, you shouldn't be doing that. Well, God doesn't. Well, you don't. And now we're just debating. and We don't even love them. We're just setting them straight because we become proud in our own knowledge. And we're just correcting everybody's words and sentences. And See, something I do all the time, I'll hear people talk in a circle, or I'll be in, a, in with people, and there'll be five people in a circle, and somebody will say something, and, and I'll, I can hear that it's, 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 it's full of limitation, but I know why they're saying it. I've heard dozens of people say it, and it's been taught to me, and I know where it came from, but they believe it. Sometimes you have the grace in a group setting, especially if a couple people nod and I say, now listen, honey, don't, listen, I'm not, I'm not correcting you for this. I want you to see something right now. And I'll take the time in the circle of five people and take the time after a service. Sometimes you guys see me, I'm with people till whenever because it's, it's for real. And I'll take the time and I'll put clarity to that and, and share why that's so limiting and where that'll lead. And the whole group will stand and go, oh my gosh, wow. And it's not, it's not like, how are they going to feel? I don't want to hurt them. But there's times where I'll discern and I won't say a word right then immediately because it doesn't seem like everybody's on page it's just their belief it came out of their heart out of their mouth I know they believe it and I'll find a way to say hey can I just talk to you for a second and you'll find me in a corner somewhere and we'll just be talking when you said that and I'm not being critical and I'm not nitpicking on your words it's not like I'm sitting here policing what everybody says but when you said this I just want to talk to you for three minutes. No, no, that's okay, yeah. That's another good reason to have a good name, have honor in the sight of people, have integrity so they can hear you. That's why you want to live in a manner worthy of the gospel because if, if they've got issues with you, they already can't hear what you say because they can't even get past your issues. And now they think you just have a need to be right in their life and they'll just presume on your motive. But I'll tell you what, the more people see Christ in your life, the more they'll be able to accept your words and where you're coming from. So that's, to have a good name is more valued and treasured than precious gold and silver and all that good stuff, right? So there's another truth there to why we want to walk out Christ. But I have done that stuff countless, countless, countless times because that's what love does. But my only reason for talking to them isn't to set them straight. It's not because I'm Pastor Dan and I need to show them that I have Bible knowledge. It's because I know where that belief's going to lead them. And one day they're going to cry because of that, be limited because of that, and the kingdom's so short because of that. And for their sake, I'm alone with nobody around just talking to them so that they run well. Now that's actually selfless. I, I could, I could hear that and go, oh brother. And then get out in the car with my buddy and say, man, I was just talking to circle. Do you know what that lady said? I can't even believe she believes that. But she said, see if your friends do that to you, you ought to look at them and say, well, did you talk to them about it? Well, no. Well, then why are you even telling me? Why didn't you talk to them about it? I thought you love them. Don't you love people? You love people. Man, you need to talk to them about it. Track them down right now. Go, let's get a hold of them. You need, don't talk to me about it. You didn't even talk to them. Especially when it's exploiting weakness, wrong believing. Because then you just sow that into somebody else and you didn't even help the person. You just multiplied their weakness. You just spread the fact that they got issues or something. And you didn't even talk to them. But you're talking to your friend. That's not going to help them. It's not even going to help your friend. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? See, love just responds in this stuff. But it has discernment. Some you snatch out of the fire. Some you save with compassion. And discernment knows the difference. You have to know the difference. There's not a textbook on this stuff. You follow what I'm saying? So, this question that I was answering from the ne Netherlands, the, the, way, the way we get rid of self-centeredness and grow in the things of the Spirit is your communion, your personal intimacy with God. How in Colossians, when you're supposed to put off the works of the flesh, anger, bitterness, malice, evil speaking from your mouth, etc., etc., how do you put off those things and the old man and put on the new without getting into works? You separate it from your identity. You get alone with God and say, I wasn't created for this. This has nothing to do with who I am. I'm not a man of anger and wrath and I'm not a this and this and this. You see what I mean? 
And I thank you, Father, that you created me for your goodness, your glory. I'm a man of love. Your heart is my heart. When I look through these eyes, I see exactly what you see because we're one. And I know grace empowers me to have your vision. Father, I am not ashamed to be called your son. See, I talk like that. <laughs> Makes me happy inside. <laughs> if I go around the room, you'd be amazed how many people haven't even thought to pray like that. They're just trying to do better and be better, which means their hearts are sincere and pure and God can work with it but in all our getting we need to get understanding amen amen so coming across with, with the wrong way with people you know I said about having the, the four day or four month experience and the healing who knows I'm zealous now do you, you understand what I mean by that yeah. I'm like zoom, zoom, zoom. I'm like wow <laughs> right and I'm I'm very vulnerable to touch people wrong right now because I'm only four months saved and my heart's on fire and honestly, a lot of people's hearts aren't on fire. And honestly, a lot of people have more knowledge than they have fire in their heart. And the knowledge is what's keeping the fire from their heart because the knowledge isn't even in the light of truth. It's Christian religion knowledge. Do you follow what I'm saying? So now I'm a little bit in a problem here because now, now I'm, I'm lit up and I've got experience under my belt and people are trying to tell me not to be overzealous with your experience because it's not always that way and it's great when God does that but he doesn't always choose to. Now I got that coming out a dime a dozen. But shortly after that, 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 that guy, that, that, that testimony, this is what I mean by touching people wrong sometimes you don't realize it. I'm in an aisle and a Christian fellow walks up to me and he's telling me he's got to go to the doctor, he's got to leave. And I'm like, doctor, what? Now what am I thinking when he says he's got to go to the doctor? I just seen his hernia go close under my hand. And I'm thinking, doctor, I want to pray for you. Man, I'm pumped. So I'm zealous. And he says, doctor, what do you mean doctor? He says, oh, I got this intestinal thing and da-da-da. I said, well, what's, it? what's that? Where does that come from? What he said, well, it comes from stress. Now, he's a Christian, and in my mind, I've been praying for four months. Father, I thank you. I'll never be stressed out again because I'm born again. I'm a Christian. Yeah, in my mind, I'm thinking everybody understands what I'm growing. And I'm thinking Christians know that the old's gone and the new's come. And I said, stress. So I was so offensive. I was so out of order, but I didn't mean wrong. But I touched him wrong. I, and I stressed him out. I said, I said, stress. Well, what are you doing with stress? You're a Christian. <laughs> and he totally stressed. <laughs> called me high-minded, called me arrogant. You see what I mean? Dan, you need to get out and on face reality. Life is stress. Traffic is stress. Bills is stress. Everybody has stress. And he's stressed out. <laughs> and I went, oh my, I think I touched him wrong. <laughs> And I learn. See, you learn as you go. You learn as you go. I was overzealous. I was zeal without knowledge. I, wasn't, I didn't say that to protect him. I didn't say that to pull him out of. I was just comparing myself to him in my zeal and my excitement. It wasn't a willful evil thing, but that's exactly what I did. Do you see what I mean? So you make mistakes. And I, and I realized what I did because I pushed his stress button. I actually antagonized something that I was believing shouldn't be there. I pushed it. I pushed it. And I went, man, listen, I'm sorry, da-da-da, and I tried to get... And then later, he actually came up to me. This was a couple weeks later. And said, hey, you know that time, da-da-da. And this was a guy that was a Christian for 22 years. He said, man, you know how I got that way? He said, I'm sorry. I realize you're really excited. And you meant what you said to me. I just took it so personal the way I came across. But I want to tell you, there's things that I see in your life that I so honor and so respect that I haven't understood for 22 years of being a Christian. There's things I see in your life at this young age and Christianity that I didn't know when I was six months. So I can't say it's just because you just got saved. And you're just excited. Well, what's that mean anyway? Well, you're just excited. You just got saved. But wait till you calm down and settle down and the world comes back to reality and eats your lunch and then you're just... What are we even saying? <sighs> so here's how you grow in this stuff. Uh, a couple years later, a co-worker came up to me and it was so hot in the warehouse. And I'm, I'm talking it was 106 in the warehouse 
no ventilation. People were complaining. Some were going home. They were getting the union stewards in there to shut the place down because it was, you know, unethical work conditions. They were putting drinks out for everybody in big ice bins. And here's the cool thing. I'm on a three-month fast mandated by the Spirit of God. I'm not telling you to do this. The Spirit of God told me to do something that I didn't even know at the time was really possible. I'm drinking a glass of water at lunch and eating a sandwich. Running five miles a day and working ten hours, four, ten hour day shifts. And all I was doing was drinking a glass of water at lunch and eating a sandwich. And I did that for three months. A glass of water and a sandwich at lunch for three months. Didn't eat nothing and drink nothing and worked ten hours and ran five miles every day in the summer. And never lost extra weight. It was just a supernatural spiritual thing. It was God told me to do it. He, 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 it's just fun. So here I am with my perspective. So I'm not going to work going like this. Oh no, 106 degrees. This is going to be, oh God. And it's the talk of the town. And it's the consumed mindset of the people. See, your eye is the lamp of your body. And it's not about denial and religious well, it doesn't matter, brother, if it's 106, because God will take care of me. And I'm, not, I'm not thinking 106. I'm thinking, thank God I'm alive. The Spirit of God's in me. I'm on this fast. I'm going to work. I'm not thinking, oh, here we go. I'm thinking, oh, Jesus. So watch this. I'm working. It, it made people so mad. They're soaking wet, sweated. They're all dirty because they're putting everything against them. And some of the things in the place was dirty. They're, like the guys, especially the guys that had the bigger bellies. They were black. Their bellies were black because everything's against their belly, right? And, and they're sweated and it would stick. And they, they're at the time clock when you're ready to leave. And they got dirt streaks and sweat streaks down them. And they're black. And I'm kind of at the time clock just kind of... I'm there. And then they get so mad. I realized... I realized in that season, I didn't, it was totally supernatural. I didn't feel hot. I wasn't sweating. I wasn't even drinking because I was on this fast thing. And it was, the, it was the three months right before I stepped on to full-time pastor. And I didn't know I was going to step on full-time pastor. I actually said no three times to the offer. And my pastor said, have you even prayed about it? I said, I haven't even thought about it. I'm a warehouse worker in love with Jesus. I'm not a pastor. And he said, well, maybe you ought to ask the Lord what he wants you to do. And I walked in the bedroom to pray about it, and I never even made it to the bed. The presence of the Lord came over me. The Lord said, Dan, I want you to do this. I'll give you grace. It's, it's a calling. And I went, wow. It is? Yeah. And I gave my two weeks notice immediately and just did it. And when I stepped into pastoring, it actually had felt like I pastored my whole life. It's amazing. But I wasn't striving to get in the ministry. I'm already in the sun. Yet? Yeah. yeah. But this person walked up to me and come around the corner, and I understand what they were doing. And, and, and they're like, oh, man, this heat. I said, hey, how you doing? Yeah, well, you know, heat. And just the devastation and the oh, and... And I said, hey, listen, now my heart was totally different than that time where I said, stress, what are you doing with stress? No. You know, on this one, I was so sensitive. I said, can I talk to you? I haven't shared this with you. It's freaking me out. It's amazing. I said, I want to share something with you about perspective and what I'm learning right now. Because you know what? It is 106 in here. And all of a sudden, they're looking at me like, here we go. <laughs> Super spiritual guy. You know how we stereotype? Yeah. We project? So now she can't even hear my... She can't even hear. Because she's already got me, oh brother. And I said, God's showing me that in the eye. And, and, and I noticed that that's... And I'm telling and explaining it. And she said, oh, you just, Dan, you know, you sometimes you just make me so mad. And man, she let me have it. Said, I'm religious. I'm proud. I'm super spiritual. Called me a lot of stuff. And said, you're just so haughty and high-minded. So super spiritual. She's so above the rest of us. She said, why don't you just come back down on the earth with the rest of us? 
And I'm thinking, no! <laughs> All the work it took him to get me off the earth, I am not coming back down! <laughs> I will appear to be here, but I will not be here! <laughs> But that's what, that's what they say. Yeah. You need to come down onto the earth with the... Well, that's that thing Olivia read in the Amplified Bible yesterday. Didn't let anybody take you captive and plunder you with the world's ways, the basic principles, the just mentality of life. And not supernatural, spiritual-minded stuff, right? So, so I looked at her. Now, now, am I boasting in my experience, or am I trying to invite her in? Huh, see? I want to invite her in. I care about that. And she doesn't want in. And I began, my eyes teared up. Why? Because she's rejecting me? Are you kidding me? I'm walking in this thing. How can you reject me? I'm having the time of my life. I don't need you to applaud it. I'm in it. I don't need you to write an article and put it in Time Magazine and all that, whatever. I don't. I'm in it, right? So I start weeping. Well, guess what tears mean immediately to a person that's in that position? Now I heard them. So they went away and I said, man, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Oh, Dan, you just need to reconsider how you come across and the things you say. And they rode away and I'm like... And it took me about three steps and oh, it was me. Because I'm, I'm for her, now I'm just me. Well, a little later, zoop, up the aisle comes this person. And they said, look, hey, I know, man, just forgive me, it's hot, moody. See, hot, moody. Yeah. See, when you start thinking, all of a sudden, you have permission for everything that's not God. Yeah. Now the environment's Lord. Mm-hmm. And dictates your life. Mm-hmm. Instead of truth and integrity. And all of a sudden, you have an excuse for your flesh. <laughs> it's just the way it is. It's natural knowledge. The environment, you know, I'm just moody and I talked to you very harsh. I didn't mean that. I mean, I mean, I wish you'd hear what I was saying. I didn't mean what I said, but I didn't mean it that way. And I'm sorry I hurt you. And I said, honey, it's okay. You didn't hurt me. Oh, see, there you go again. Now you're just too spiritual to be hurt. Now you can't even be hurt. Now you're not hurt. I saw the tears in your eyes. And I said, honey, those tears in my eyes... And they filled right back up in my eyes. So let me put it this way. We're two little kids on a playground. And I just found two lollipops. And I opened one up. It was the best thing I ever tasted. And I tried to give you the other one. And you said, no, I don't like the flavor. I said, they were the tears in my eyes, honey. Not because you hurt me. Because you don't have the ears to hear the glory of what I'm trying to share with you. And you won't unwrap the lollipop. And at least lick it. You just judged it by the cover. Now see, I don't have enough wisdom to come up with something that sharp. (laughs) That was spur of the moment. And that was Holy Ghost. Because that's exactly what was happening. We're two children. Be like kids. Be like children. We're two kids in the playground. But unfortunately, this one child's become so sophisticated. That word sophisticated is not a cool word, by the way. It means lack of innocence. So sophisticated that they judge the book by the cover and don't even unwrap and lick and find out how good it is. And then presume that my tears were hurt. And then when I say, no, I'm not hurt, now I have to be hurt because natural knowledge says you have to be if somebody treats you that way. But the kingdom says there's no cause for offense in your brother when you become love. No cause. I'm going to go with God on this one. Okay? <laughs> so when I say, you're, you know, I'm way past being offended by you, God's took me to a place, time will tell if I'm right. One day we'll find out if I'm telling the truth. You can judge and presume all you want, but one day we'll find out. <laughs> See, when I talk like that, I get fuzzy inside. Because <laughs> I live with me. I'm trapped with me. But I like it. Okay, look at this. Look at this, uh, Romans 5. You guys okay? You sure you're alright? We'll take a break soon. We've been justified by faith, 5.1. Oh, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting we were in Romans 4. Verse 24. 
But also for us it shall be imputed to us who believe to him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Verse 25. Who was delivered up because of our offenses. Why was he delivered up? Isn't that amazing? So who judges somebody else for somebody else's offenses? God delivered him up for our offenses. He didn't deliver us up. He delivered him up. Come on, that should be, that should mean so much. <laughs> who did he deliver up? He delivered up Jesus for whose offenses? Man, it's one thing to pay for your own offenses. It's another thing when somebody's paying for your offenses, right? Because he goes on to talk about this. Watch, he gets into it. Just the way God writes is so amazing. He was delivered up for our offenses and raised up for our what? Oh, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, right? Come on, he's not a philosophy, he's not a dying doctrine. He's alive, he's a living Lord. Oh, look, therefore, oh my, we finally made it, Brent. <laughs> therefore, because this is true, we are justified by... So we just believe those last three verses. We just say, man, that sounds amazing to me. Yeah. You mean you went to the cross for my offenses? Not your offenses, my offenses. Yeah, because I love you and you're more than your offenses. Your life is more than what you've been living. And I'm the light in the world and in my light you'll see light. And if you just look to me, I'll draw you to me because you understand there's more to you than what there's been. And I love you and I'm bringing the best out in you. Won't you please come home? That's what the gospel's saying. We've turned it into pray a prayer to go to heaven and get Jesus in your heart. I know that sounds raw and mean when I say it that way, but we need to get a better grip. This thing is not about praying a prayer to go to heaven and get Jesus in your heart and then still feel the same way, live by the same motivations, produce the same fruits, but at least the bus is going to pick me up someday when the trumpet blows. No, it's walk in a manner worthy of Him. It's bear the fruit of righteousness. <laughs> it's a whole lot bigger than waiting to go to heaven. Heaven's come back to us. The kingdom is where? It's here. It's at hand. I'm looking at the kingdom of God right now. And that's not heresy. Jesus said, don't look here. Don't look there. The kingdom is within you. So I'm looking at the kingdom of God. And if we start seeing what he sees, we will manifest that truth. He's looking at the kingdom in us and we're going, who, me? Yeah, but you don't understand. But how could he? Yeah, but. Mm, uh, he, uh. Right? Yeah. Therefore, we've been justified by what? Oh, there's that faith thing again. We have peace with God through who? So what gives us peace with God? The fact that Jesus came, died, and rose again. He has, Martha asked yesterday, He has cursed sin in the flesh. He has, he has annulled the power and the voice and the judgment of any sin that's ever been found in humanity. And He has crushed its power. <laughs> and He will cast it in a sea of forgetfulness and remember it no more. And He will call you out of the darkness into the light. And if you see the gospel clear, it puts integrity in you, honor in you, and desire in you for the things of God. Do you get it? The gospel says that's why you don't love God first. You see God first loved you. That's why people struggle so much with receiving the love of God. Because the devil knows if they ever just finally see, accept, and receive the love of God, they'll find out the beauty of who they are, and they'll manifest truth. Because if you love God, you'll keep His... So why not get them to just struggle with the love of God, get them into works, try to keep His commandments and fail, weigh themselves short and never see themselves lovable, even though He does already love them, and then get them to miss it, and that's create legalism and religion and works, and get them just trapped going to a service, and at least they're in a church, and hoping they're saved. That's the devil. Yeah. Through whom? Verse 2. So we have peace with God through Jesus, and through whom? 
meaning Jesus, we also, oh, this is fun, we have, now, now listen how progressive this is. Let me read this and have fun with this and read it progressive. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom now we have access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, we rejoice in our tribulation or glory in our tribulation knowing the tribulation. He jumps right in into we're all going to go through trials and he's excited he's building he says and we have access into grace in which we now stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God and not only that we glory when times are tough because we're for real and God rocks and yay we're going to (laughs) win that's what he's saying or it's just all about me and I'm a Christian for me and when tribulation comes we go oh (laughs) No, that's what the grace is for. That's why you stand in it. That's why you're at peace with God, so you can win this way. You don't lose this because of this. This doesn't question or challenge this. This is already settled. And when this is settled, you have the power to fight this. Oh, oh this is so good. I'm getting born again. I love, I love preaching and teaching, man. I, I really think I'm going to start believing this stuff. The more I preach it, I'm going to believe it. Sooner or later, it's just, it's mine. (laughs) And not only that. Do you hear he's in the same tone? He actually just took a notch up. And not only that. We glory in tribulation. Knowing. See, there's something you have to know. Tribulation's going to bring the best out in you. Because you're not a fly-by-night weekend warrior. You're not 30-day money-back guarantee, 60-day try me, see if you like me, Christian. You are in this thing and you've given your life. Time will tell. Right? Perseverance. Tribulation gives me the ability to stand and, and gives me the opportunity and the platform to stand and show that I'm for real. <laughs> Isn't that what it says? No wonder if you get an agreement with that. Man, you freak the devil out. You put him in a tough place now. Because yeah. he doesn't even know if he can poke you now. Now he's a, Every time he pokes you, Jesus oozes out. He forms you in Christ. He builds you in revelation, understanding. Next time, you want him so freaked out, he doesn't even know how to... He doesn't... Ah! Because he, he has to touch you. Because steal, kill, destroy, steal. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> Serious! You want that process going on in your life. Where he's walking around trying to look where to touch you. And, and, and he's just... Because yeah, every time he touches you, you manifest truth. You mani- It had to be that way trying to get to Jesus, right? Yeah. And finally, he just finally he just got the masses to just boo, and darkness overtakes. And Jesus says, "Do what you came for." It's the hour of darkness. God just pulls back his hand and lets darkness just sweep and do what it does, swoop, and play right into the wisdom of God, and kill the Son of God. Oh, because when he kills him, he loses. So let's just back up and let's just unleash him and let him do what all he knows to do. Because he thinks when he kills, he wins. Well, this time, pal, when you killed, you just lost. Because now, because you killed, many, 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 many people will live. (gasps) So see, how can he defeat God? Only by getting us to fail to stand in truth and be in agreement with God. That's the only way. See, he knows he can't defeat God personally, but he believes he can defeat God and God's purpose in us. He's been messing with people since the garden. And he knows he can't knock Jesus off the throne. But he believes he can get him off the throne of your own soul. It's the only thing he can do. Not only that, we glory. See, now I don't know that to be the normal response in tribulation. It's usually tears and a phone call. (laughs) Just being real. Is it okay if I tell the truth? Are we here to tell the truth? Okay, good. I mean, you don't want me to modify anything, do you? (laughs) Come on. 
You, you, glory and tribulation. If, if you can't glory and tribulation and see through a good eye that rejoices and grabs a hold of truth and looks for the manifestation of Jesus, you have to see that, wow, there's a, there's a personal vein here. There's still a self-centered, self-perspective, self-defending, self-preservation thing working in me that, you know, how this is affecting me and here we go again and why me? And that's the part you got to go back into that secret place and die to that self-centered thing and say, God, this is not the mindset I'm created for. This is unproductive. This is... This is like a vulnerability. This is a bullseye on my spiritual life. Satan's trying to take advantage and opportunity of a wrong perspective here. And I am not alive for me. It's not about what I'm going through. It's about the truth of what you went through and who I really am because of you. Thanks for building that in me and making it strong and fortify God. And you stay in this place. When that stuff's exposed, don't fall out and lose your identity and drag your lip on the ground for three days and say you're a loser. But if you get caught in that and you realize you just for three days, you know, been living in levels of deception and wrong identity and feeling sorry for yourself. Once you realize you're feeling sorry for yourself, don't go, oh God, why am I still doing that? I should be over that by now. Don't do that. If you find you're feeling sorry for yourself, shake out of that and go, wow, I so thank you for the light in my life that exposes that for what it is. What a lie. I used to live that way all the time. God, you're sharpening me. You're pulling me out of this. I am changing. Oh, God, I thank you. I am home. You ought to rejoice. Because you're free. You get it? There was a time you lived that way and thought it was normal. <laughs> right? And truth is changing that. So look at this. Not only that, we glory in our tribulation. It produces perver perseverance. Perseverance what? Character. Character what? Hope. Now, hope does not disappoint. Why? Because the love of God. You see how important it is to be rooted and grounded in love? The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by Holy Spirit who was given to us. Look at verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Come on, that's amazing. He did this because He wanted to, because He saw our value, our destiny, our created inheritance. For scarcely for a righteous man would somebody give up their life. True? You know, hey, He's a good guy, but hmm, better Him than me. Come on! For scarcely would, a righteous, would, would someone for a righteous man die, yet perhaps for a good man would somebody even dare to die. Come on, it's a rare event. That somebody would take somebody's place for something like that. But God demonstrates His own love toward us. We weren't righteous. We weren't good. While we were still sinners at nature, at heart, driven by selfishness. And that's all the human eye could see. God saw something more. <sighs> this gospel is amazing. He demonstrated His own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you could go on this whole thing as a revival. You could go on. I, I'm in trouble now, actually. I mean, I could, you could go on the whole way through Romans 8. Never quit. Much more than, much more than having now... See, you're, you're assumed by the writer to be justified. <laughs> Much more now being justified. You've been justified. You're already it's done. He's raised from the dead. You're vindicated. You're acquitted. It's over. You're innocent. <laughs> Do you get this? Just one moment ago, you were alienated an enemy by wicked works in your minds. Colossians 1, two days ago in school, right? And now, because he rose from the dead, you're holy, blameless, and above reproach. The blood is amazing. Here's the... See, we say, yeah, but you got to clean this up and you got to change... No, you have to believe that first because that's what will shake you into transformation. That's what puts integrity in you. That's what it means to receive the first love of God. Knowing that the way you were, God saw better in you, more about you, deeper in you. Do you get it? No. <laughs> that's the first love of God. The ability to not judge a book by its cover. And we were doing all those things, guys. 
And he said, that is not who you are. I know who you are. I've known you from the beginning. And I know what I created you for. Son, go pay the price. I'm bringing them home. <laughs> Much more being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That means judgment. That was Rick's comment yesterday. Sinclair. Perfect love casts out all fear. People fear torment and condemnation. The only reason condemnation can live is because we're not perfected in love. He did not send his son to condemn the world. But that through him, the world might be... So he did what? He did... Say that with me. He did not send his son to condemn me. <laughs> Amen? But that through his own very own son, the world would be saved. The word sozo. Healed, delivered, protected, preserved, made whole, kept safe and sound. You get it? It's deep, it's powerful, and it's break time. Go ahead. Bless you. So many places. I mean, you know, I was just talking on the break to Linda. If, if we confess our sins and recognize that we've all walked in a sinful nature, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, and we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to what? Forgive us and what? Cleanse us of all, how much? All what? Unrighteousness. So if He cleanses us of all unrighteousness, it's a no-brainer. What's left? So all you can be through Christ and His mercy is righteous. And if you're seeing yourself any other way, it's deception, especially in the fact that you care enough to see yourself a certain way. Like, like I was sharing with Linda, a lot of times some of the purest people I've met in my life live under the suffering of the most condemnation in the secret turmoil in the back corridors of their life and their soul when nobody's looking there they're under this thing all the time the most because they're constantly criticizing they feel like they don't live up to their love for God their purity nitpicking criticizing themselves it's a trap from hell it's, it's demonic it's life he's taking advantage of a pure heart some of the purest people some of the people that I know they, they care so much that it's a detriment to them in that sense you, you have to find a healthy place in your, your care and receiving love and mercy. You can't look at your life under the law. You have to look at your life under, the, under grace. Amen. Now, does that give you permission to sin? Well, of course not. You're not even thinking sin in the first place. You see what I mean? So, you have to see your life under grace. And that doesn't give you permission to just live loose. Well, the people that are pure and hurting like that and care so much aren't looking for permission to live loose. I tell people I'm not afraid to preach righteousness because I haven't found a way to sin and get away with it. That's not what we're preaching. I found a way to, to be free from it. You get it? Yes. And a lot of preachers and, and, and leaders and pastors are afraid of preaching this righteousness because they think it's given a green light to sin. It's every reason not to. It puts integrity back into you. If I can see the goodness of God so clear it leads me to change. The goodness of God leads men to what? Repentance. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Love covers a multitude of sin. So it's not hell and brimstone and fire. Messages that change your life. That just puts an unhealthy fear in you. That you're always in trouble. That God's watching your every move. That He's ready to take you out now. And when you're in a body cast, you think it's because you didn't listen and He knocked you out. And some people will preach that. If you're on the wrong road, he'll snap your legs to keep you from running. I've seen people get healed in their body and take that healed body and still go down a wrong road. And God knowing they were going to go down the wrong road with that healed body. But we think so much about it, we're afraid to pray for somebody. Look, it's God that healed them. <laughs> Come on. So, so they're, they're three quarters down that wrong road and we're intellectualizing, getting trapped in human wisdom, claiming to be spiritual and looking at the book by the cover and painting a horror story. And criticizing and trying to regroup and we haven't even seen the thing finished yet. We haven't even seen the finished story. We're just, oh, woe is me because they're on the wrong road. 
Well, see, you shouldn't even pray for them to be healed. And now they're going to be seven times worse. And they shouldn't even, you shouldn't even give them, <laughs> but they get three quarters down that road and Holy Spirit brings them back to the time they were healed and da 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 and all of a sudden they're wondering what am I doing out here God really doesn't do it next thing you know the, the God revelation the goodness of God the times of mercy come back to them and saves them in a time of darkness in a time of need why? because you put light in dark places and light shines in the dark and all of a sudden they're way out there in Never Never Land and because we didn't minister to them because we're waiting for them to line up first we've put nothing in them to call them home that's right I just read to you where not one of us changed first. You were alienated by wicked works in your mind. That was the other day. Today, you were yet a sinner. Not one of us changed first. We just heeded the wooings and callings of the Spirit of God based on the seeds that have been sown in you along the way. You don't even realize the seeds that have been sown in you along the way. And God caused them to grow. Did you have a question, comment? Yeah, give her the mic so she can just... No, no. Actually, verse 9, I don't see verse 9 in the context. Verse 9 of 1 John 1, guys, that's where she's at. Let's go there because this is important because this was actually a talk of mine on the break with somebody, this very thing. Do you know how we take one-liners out of the Bible and we make it say something? And we do a great injustice. One of the greatest things that, that, that pe- rise up in people's mind when I'm preaching what I'm preaching is on righteousness is people say, well, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and make God a liar. I've, I've, I've actually been asked that question by pastoral leadership and stuff. I was actually in a service. It was so fun. I was in a service. I looked... I didn't know this guy was a pastor, but I looked at him. When I looked at him, I heard him saying that in his mind. And I said, I looked right at him. I said, one of the biggest things we say when you hear what I'm preaching is that if we say we have no sin, he looked and said, that's exactly what I was just thinking. I said, yeah, I know. (laughs) I'm looking right at him and we talk and I answered and I took him right there. The scripture was so beautiful. It's God loving him. Because if I'm preaching now and he has this contest in his mind and he's got this rebuttal in his mind because that's what it was in him. It was a rebuttal. That's not what Martha's doing. This was a rebuttal. He, it's going to hinder him from hearing anything else I say because he's found fault in what I'm saying based on the one-liner and the way he's been brought up in that one-liner. See, those one-liners are devastating to us because you grow up hearing people flash out those comments and then you embrace them into your belief system and don't even realize it. Isn't it amazing how God will cry out through Jesus and through the Son and preach clear truth, but we'll grab one-liners and hold tight, and then the truth comes, and we're like, yeah, but we're holding on to the one-liner. It's just amazing. (laughs) Watch. This is really good. When you read this section of Scripture, even in verse 9 okay let me do this thanks this is good I'm getting help on this one to cover both sides of this I don't read 1 John 1 9 as just uh, something to fall back on every time I sin that's how it's preached it's not what it's saying it's actually talking about your born again experience and walking in the light because what Martha's saying she's totally correct once you're righteous you're righteous Now, if you do sin, say you commit some sense of sin, here's the big deal of this. You have to recognize you don't ever identify with unrighteousness once you're born again. You identify with the mercy of God and the blood of Jesus and the forgiveness. That should, if you mean that, if you're sincere about that, it'll put integrity in you. So sin doesn't become a small thing. That's what pastors are afraid of, to teach this in a way where people become, oh, whatever, God will just forgive me. Well, God will just love me. Well, God loves me. You see what I mean? 
And they're afraid of that. No, I, I believe the total different. Uh, the goodness of God causes change in my life. It's the good news that changes my life. But, but, but so, so there's unrighteousness, say, in sin, etc. But the, what Martha's saying, I would totally agree with in the sense of this. Even if you sin, if you sin, and, the, and it covers this. this whole, well, let me just read it because it covers it. Watch how well this is written. Look at verse 5 in uh, 1 John 1. This is the message which we have heard from him. Who'd, who'd he hear what he's writing from? What he's writing right now is the message he heard from him. Oh, good. <laughs> so you got to believe that. You can get cynical and say, well, a man wrote the book. How do I know he heard that? You can, get, you, know, you, can, you can give yourself permission to be your own God all day long and let your mind rule. That's just the fall of man at its finest. <laughs> a God unto yourself. I love that God asked me to believe this is the Word of God because it forces me, it humbles me, it gets me out of my mind and puts me into His. I don't want to live and be wise in my own opinion. We value our opinions so much. Isn't it amazing how much we value our opinion and yet our esteem most of the time isn't even healthy? <laughs> it's just an amazing thought. <laughs> This is the message which we've heard from him and declare it to you. I'm declaring it. We can turn the mic up or I'll just yell louder. I'm declaring it to you. <laughs> that God is what? He's light and in him is no what? Darkness. Now where does he live? He's in me. He's in you, Donna. Donna said, in me. <laughs> See, she's getting so personal with us. She didn't even say in us. <laughs> and that's okay. That's good. Because she's getting it. She said, in me. <laughs> I don't know about anybody else, but I know one thing. He's in me. <laughs> See? So where's God? In, me. in us. And in him's no darkness. <laughs> Woo, that's good. Now watch. If we say we have fellowship with him. In other words... If we're saying that we know Him, we're born again, we've entered into Him, and we walk in the darkness, He's not talking about a misnomer, a stumbling into sin. He's talking about walking and living in the darkness. That's what He's talking about. Just willful, whatever, God knows my heart. Hey, everybody, you know, hey, stop judging me. By the way, this is a school. Judging. You know how we pull that card out all the time? Don't judge me. Judging means to presume upon. It means to look and weigh and make a decision and presume upon without knowing. If I know there's two youngsters that I'm pastoring and they're getting their conscience all messed up and they're crossing lines and, and, and I know that to be true. If one of them came to me crying and said, look, me and, me and Johnny are just, man, we've been in trouble and da, da, da. And then I talk to them. And then I sit them down to talk to them. They have no weight in saying, well, listen, you ain't supposed to judge us. I'm not judging you. You're already in it. See, that's a cop-out. When somebody says that, that actually reveals that they have no sense of repentance. And then it changes the way you handle things. You still love them. You still have to love them, but you have to give them truth and understanding on why this is detrimental to their lives, their relationship, and even the church in which they attend. It's not legalistic. See, we don't understand why we correct people. We get legalistic. Well, you shouldn't do that. Well, that's not allowed. Well, what are you doing that for? Well, you know God said not to do it. And, 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 and leadership has been very guilty of just do's and don'ts. Instead of putting the why behind it. I tell you what. I get a young man and a young lady alone and tell you why. It'll put such a conviction in you. You will have to choose, harden your heart and straight face yourself and cross the line willfully. And that's the position as a pastor I'm to put you in. To bring the best out in your heart and give you the ability to do best. You see what I mean? Because I will share the beauty of why where it's not a legalistic thing, where it's not a law. You shouldn't be doing that if you attend this church. And then all of a sudden you have, you're full of the desire. And you have no grace and ability of understanding to keep from the desire. And you just know you're not to. So Christianity becomes a straitjacket. No, in all you're getting, get understanding. The understanding is what puts the value of a thing in you and diffuses things that aren't edifying. 
Until I understood this stuff, I, you know, I, did, I was never addicted to pornography and I didn't make a strong effort to go into it, but I didn't avoid it when it was around me and it caught my attention in many occasions. When I was 11 years old, I found a magazine on a railroad track. That was my introduction to sexuality. That was my big breakthrough day. <sighs> Now that I understand, see what happens to me? Now that I understand, I see it for what it is. It is totally lost luster and value. It's actually, it makes me cry. Because I understand what it is now. Now I see. Now the eye is the lamp of the body, and I see. So is there a draw? Is there an attraction? Is there a pull? Not at all. Why? Because something has been unveiled, and I see it for what it really is. And I see what it really produces. And I see what it really invokes. And it's fantasy and self-serving and self-centered at the expense of human flesh. It's me, myself, and I. It's all about me, me, me. It's selfishness at its finest. And it's confusion and lost identity and dishonor. And it's all that. It's all that and more, actually. I just... But I see that now. So now am I, as a man in ministry struggling why because I'm such a good dedicated Christian because of what I see and what I understand <laughs> I just feel really uh, right now <laughs> you don't just tell two young people well, you aren't supposed to do that well don't let me find you doing that again you sit and you tell man we're right at we're right at this pastor's question this is an excellent question Michael, did you know we were? I just hit me in the Holy Ghost. Watch. In light of what you're teaching about righteousness and the eye through which you see someone, if we see someone as righteous, even though they're walking in sin, or if they love God and they're, and they're caught in sin, let's say sexual sin, and they're not acknowledging that sin, the, the love God or they love God and, and, and are gifted in being used in ministry you have a good relationship with this person and they're telling uh, you one thing but you know the facts do you remove that person from ministry if they conf until they confess their sin do you love them uh, uh, and, and just see them through God's eyes and allow the goodness of God and the expression of that goodness over time to lead them to repentance just curious what your perspective might be. I was trained in church to remove that person immediately from ministry until they repent. From your perspective and what you're teaching, what's the correct response? Man, these are questions that are amazing. I am trying to retrain my eye to be single and would love to know your heart on this. Okay? Let me just start by this question right here. There's no textbook answer for every situation. You have to learn discernment and let love be your motive. I would caution uh, Michael in asking the question and knowing the situation, any of us in any other situation, be very careful. I don't know what, what, what Michael's calling the facts, because sometimes the facts are hearsay. It's, it's what somebody else is saying. If I got a good friend in my life, okay, it's, it's, if, if Sh it's Shane, right? If Shane and I are buds, and somebody comes and tells me something about Shane and Shane's doing this and that and I run right to Shane because I said, well, did, did Shane know? Did you talk to Shane? Well, no. Well, why are you telling me? Well, I just thought you'd want to know. Well, I don't want to know for, to, just for hearsay's sake. I love Shane. I'm going straight to Shane. Shane, man, somebody just, it doesn't matter who because Shane could, he could be in a moment. Who said that? Who told you? It doesn't matter. They told me this and somebody out there is believing that and I love you too much to just believe that's even true or wonder if it's true. I'm coming to you. I love you. What's going on, man? Is there any truth to this? And I'm not judging you. It's been sown into my soul and I need to know the truth so my heart's in a good place because I love you and I see the best and I need to know what's going on. Shane can either look at me and say, I have no idea why they're saying that and I wish they wouldn't be saying that. No, it's not true. He might break down cry and say, man, I've been wanting to talk to you. I just know what to do. I'm glad this came out, man. Whatever, right? Yeah. But if, 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 if I'm just going by what I'm calling facts, what even one or two or three other people said, I've learned in the church. And hear me clear. Just because one, two, or three people are saying it, they're only saying it maybe because they're totally believing the hearsay. Because Sally told Joni and Joni told Betty. And, and sorry I used women. Billy told Johnny and Johnny told Fred. Uh, it didn't, uh, this, this, this must have been important. I, this, oh. <laughs> Don't let that be important, but 
I didn't mean, I didn't use women on purpose. I just, it could be anybody. And then all of a sudden, you know, well, how do you know that to be true? I had a pastor in my life that used to always say that. He taught me that. He said, he said, he said, if somebody comes to you based, saying something about somebody, you always ask, how do you know that to be true? Well, because so-and-so said, but did you talk to this person that they're saying it about? Well, no, then how do you know it to be true? Well, but yeah, but they were crying. And I mean, then they said they, and that, whoa, whoa, whoa. How do you know it to be true? There was a thing some people had pinned on me years ago. I was just fresh pastoring. It was going around. I had no idea. And I walked into church one day on a Sunday. Halls full of kids. People all around. This lady come up to me. And I said hi to somebody and hugged them. Love you. And she just broke down and, and, and manifested, right? All her gossip frustrations in front of everybody. It was, it, was, it was a tragic thing. And thank God that I actually am what I preach. Because she just blasted me with how can you smile and play this hypocrisy and hi I love you when you're this and this and this and I didn't even know what she was talking about. Well that puts you in a pretty uncomfortable place especially if you're not secure. Because now you're a cat in the corner, you're against the wall, you're between a rock and a hard place, you're in defense, you're snarling, scrapping, fighting. I just smiled, I said, honey, I am so sorry this is happening. I wish you'd consider right now. Oh, consider the kids. Why don't you just... Da, da, da. She wasn't calming down. And everybody's like... And I said, no, honey, that's going to, in a room. We'll talk. We can talk about anything. My life is open and exposed to you. I said, honey, it's just... It's just you're, you're putting this on all these children, all these people. Let's just go in the room. It's okay. Come on. And I said, honey, we closed the door. I said, sweetheart, you're very upset and there's something going on. I honestly don't even have an idea what you're talking about. I look at right now, I have no clue. So you're going to have to walk me through this so I can answer properly. But I don't even know what you're talking about. And when I said that real innocent and real calm, it unglued her and she realized she had never talked to me, came to me. She just believed everything she heard through the grapevine. And she was putting me on the cross, crucifying me, judging me as guilty and never even talked to me. To the point where she actually approached me personally and let me have it and didn't even know what she heard to be true. You be very careful what you allow in your belief system. If you love people, you don't allow things in your belief system. Unless you, if you tell something about Anthony to me and, and it's not a healthy or a good thing, God forbid I take it into my heart and start seeing him through that and then somehow unconsciously treating him that way because I believe something that's not even him. You follow me? This thing is a trap from hell and it's, it's huge in the body of Christ. And it's got to stop. They said what? They did what? Sometimes when somebody's interpreting what they said, it's only from their own perspective of hurt and offense and insecurity. They might have said the words, but when you say the words, it might not even mean what they're hearing. And then you get hurt and get offended and in your pain you tell three other people what so and so said and when so and so said it they didn't even know you were hurt and offended and didn't even know you had the insecurity and yet you hurt them that way because you're touchy. And now you just made four other people contaminated through your weakness at the cost of an identity over here. Back to this pastor's question. I get people alone where they're, where they're non-threatened. I get people alone and I tell them, and I'm answering you directly, Michael. Uh, I tell them, you know, what I'm concerned about, what I'm hearing, whatever these facts are, and I give them every opportunity to come clean and confess without settling a belief in my heart. You can't make them feel, if I got Anthony, I can't make him feel like I'm grilling him, trying to get him to come clean and break as if I already believe he's guilty. I'd say, listen, buddy, and we've talked about stuff. He knows my heart on all kinds of stuff over the years we've talked. I would, I would talk to Anthony, listen, buddy, I'm hearing this. I don't know nothing to be true. I don't know what's true. But if it would be true, of course, it'd be a concern. But I need to hear from you as a brother, man. Once it's in my ears, once it's in my heart and mind, I need to know. I'm not going to gossip. I'm not going to tell somebody else about this. What's up, man? What, do we need to, do, is there any validity, any truth? And don't be bothered that I'm asking this question. I am in the position now that it's come into my ears. I love you. 
well, no, I don't even know. There's got to be an explanation. Or, well, it's not kind of all like that, Dan. And then there, all of a sudden I go, wow, now I see, yeah. That stuff has happened with me. And then you put the pieces together and make sense of it. Or a person will just say, man, yeah, listen, man. And they'll just come clean, right? Now watch. If all I have is hearsay and all I have is surface facts, things that point to okay so if I see two young folks and they're looking really close and and all of a sudden they're coming out of a room and there wasn't even a light on and all of a sudden you know this points to this points to this the next thing you know you know wow I think the car never left last night and all of a sudden you already determine what went on behind that door that's judgment even though everything points to what probably happened or might have happened in that sense of the natural. You might be amazed there's pure situations. You might be amazed there could be a parent in the house, a car that's not driving, and, and, a, and a girl up in her room, and the young man down on the couch, and nothing hanky-panky, and yet because you drive by, there's an appearance of evil, and we just quick presume and project and judge. And then we say, you know so-and-so was over at so-and-so's house, and their car was there all night. They never even left till the morning. That is the world. That is gossip. That is sin. It should never be in a Christian's mouth. Because you don't even know what happened behind the door. You don't even know. Wonder if they were doing all night prayer and the mom was right in the middle of the circle. And you're assuming they're in fornication. That would be a short twisted view, huh? <laughs> you just need to be careful. Now I'll tell you this much as a pastor. If I drove by, if I drove by and I knew some of you teens were in a relationship and I saw your car there and I was out fishing late with Dave for catfish and I drove by your house at three in the morning and your boyfriend's car was sitting there. Now I'm in the position to call you and say, hey, you guys doing good? Man, he's hanging out late. What's up? Is everything cool? Because what it looks like to Christians is this. Are you guys doing cool? Are you good? I would absolutely immediately address that. Or I put my mind in a position to what? To wonder and to judge. Bingo. Because the longer I wonder, the more I'll come to some sort of uh, belief. And I'll think, man, I bet they're feely touchy. I bet they've crossed the line. I bet they've gotten this place where they can't turn back now. And I bet they're, oh, man, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I tell you, it sure do you good to love people enough to go ask them and talk to them. Because cause wonder if she looks and, and her eyes just bat and there's light in them like there always is. And you've already kind of have her given up her virginity or sleep with this guy. And she looks at you and says, oh, I'm so glad you asked. No, we were just, and no, so and so. Didn't you see their car? And da, da, da. And I'm like, whoa. I'm so glad I asked because I could have been thinking something else. You get what I'm saying? No, Dan, that was all cool. Yeah, oh, he was there. But no, so-and-so was there and so-and-so. In fact, you didn't see Brian's car around the corner? He said, no, I didn't. Brian, I'm glad you were around the corner, buddy. Because <laughs> everything was cool. But see, you see what I mean? It'd be presumptuous, snap judgment stuff. But here's the deal. If I have a friend in relationship like this question says, and they're not coming clean, I won't judge them on it. And if I know that I know that I know, I'd pull that evidence out and it would be a friendship thing then. I'd say, well, listen, man, you got to explain this because my own heart's in trouble right now. This is, everything about this is pointing to this. Please, man, try to help me understand this because I love you and I don't want to believe anything. I want to believe you. And, and, and if they say, I can't explain that, but I'm telling you, and they'll look me in the eyes, I'm not doing this, I would absolutely believe them. And I would trust the working of Holy Spirit and the goodness of God, etc., etc., etc. Now, if I personally, if I personally walked in a side room and saw through the window and saw the porn on the computer screen and saw uh, something that they were chatting with somebody that's not their wife and appropriate stuff and, and I'm looking through the window and then I turned the corner and they heard me coming and blanked it off quick or turned it off and said, hey, how you doing? And don't want to admit it. And I say, man... What, what did I just see on the screen, man? You're, man, what's going on? You're in trouble. No, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? You know what I mean? I would have to handle that a totally different way. 
You have to take the situation based on, and I would, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't just pull the plug, you know, in the sense of, well, you ain't even fit for ministry. So it's not even at that point about ministry. At that point, it's about them. And why would you get in denial? Come on, look me in the eyes. I'm your friend. So what? You're telling me I didn't see what I just saw? Are you kidding me? Look, this isn't about right and wrong. I'm not here to spank you. I love you. What's going on in your spirit? You know, that's how I would do with a person. If they refuse to come clean, I'm in that position where certain situations I have to make decisions on what they're able because if they're in that deep a denial, that's, that's a tough situation. They're all different. Uh, most cases, if somebody doesn't admit to something and looks me in the eyes and says they're not, I rarely pull the plug on ministry on stuff. I, I trust that because sometimes when you do that, you know, that's what we're taught. Just get them out of ministry. When, when, you, when you pull out every sort of expression, all there is is a awareness of my life's in trouble, I'm lost, I'm backslidden, I'm in trouble. Do you know what I mean? It just, it, it, it just seems to have a nasty effect. And I think for years we've done that in ministry. No, I think if we're working with them, if, if we see they're in faith, if I'm in faith for them, uh, and, and we're making forward progress, man, I'm not, I don't have any trouble with them flowing in some level of forward progress that way. I don't personally. But, you know, every situation's a little different. This one's a little different too because they're not acknowledging their sin. So, if you, if you just have surface facts, hearsay, circumstantial evidence... Man, you're innocent until proven guilty in that sense. It's circumstantial. It points to it. But they're looking you in the eyes of a friend and saying, Man, I wish you didn't believe that about me. I'm trying to tell you I'm not doing this thing. I know it might seem that way. I don't even know how that worked out. But I'm just telling you that's not going on. I will believe you. And I will trust that your own conscience and Holy Spirit will come, cause you to come clean if something's not upright. But from that point on, I will treat you as if we didn't have that conversation. That's exactly how I will handle it. So I'm just letting you know. And, and if I know that I know and it's a pretty nasty thing, I've, I've had to handle some things. It's not fun. You have to make sure that you always do it for the person's sake and the sake of the whole. You have to also understand pastoring. You're covering the heart of the whole. But it's not at the expense of the person. Even when a man was corrected in Corinthians, Paul said, restore such a one. Make sure you don't get overbearing in this time and season of correction, man. Once he sees the severity of this, that he's part of a family, that he has responsibility, that his life speaks and, 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 and impacts others and influences others and he has the great call and purposes. As soon as he realizes and sees how important his life is to this whole picture, grab him and pull him right back into the picture. Don't remember him for what he did. Remember him for who he's become through Christ. That's called restoring such one. And I promise you, I've gotten um, amends with things like that with people where that situation is never even mentioned, brought up. It's not who I see them to be. I've seen people make some serious mistakes. I've had people call me crying, confessing their heart. That's a good thing. It's not about what they did. It's about the confession and the crying. That's what I build on. I don't go, you did what? I've had some serious situations. I've never told anybody because I saw repentance, brokenness, some of these people in ministry and they've never lost a day or moment of their office or ministry. Why? Because you see brokenness, repentance and behind the scenes. You're speaking, encouraging, phew, getting the man, bringing the wife into it, making sure things are clear and out in the open and then everything's just moving forward. So the body doesn't stumble. The church in weakness doesn't say they did what and then they can't get that out of their head and can never hear another message. Come on. Love covers. How much sin? Multitude. <laughs> that doesn't mean it accepts and allows. Behind the scenes, I'm doing everything I can to restore value and integrity and get Holy Spirit back in the flow of their life to where they're free from this thing. And getting them free from that being who they are is one of the biggest deals of getting healed and free. Separate them from what they did to who they are. You get it? Because that's how we label one another. We see people for what we've done. And that makes it who they are. 
and then they have our trust broken forever and we can never trust them again. So now because they failed, they're never redeemable because we never forget. Thank God he didn't see any of us like that. Yeah. I wonder why we see others like that. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Come on. This mercy, love and mercy thing is an amazing thing. So Martha had a great question. Let me just try to finish this here because I want to put this chapter in right perspective anyway because it's a very misconstrued chapter in the body of Christ. I've learned we use the one-liner big time. Because when you talk about being freed from sin, which I'm trying to get there, I'm, I tried to take, I thought I'd cover it this week, and here we are. Thursday, 20 after 11. I'm in big trouble. You only got 12 weeks left. <laughs> this one flew by. I'm like, God, I feel nervous. No. <laughs> so we declare Him to you. He's the God of light, right? No darkness in Him. If we say we have fellowship with Him, and walk in darkness, we lie. So we're just living in willful sin, whatever, yeah. You know, we're lying. If we say we have fellowship with Him and we're just living in darkness, not taking account for our heart, well then we're revealing that we really don't know Him. Right? You know what First John 4 goes as far as to say? That your love life is your barometer of knowing Him. That if you love, it's because you know Him. And if you don't love, you just don't know Him. You just know about Him. That's pretty intense. It's not condemning, it's a barometer. It says if you know Him, if you know Him, you'll love. Because He's love. That means the whole purpose of knowing God is to become like Him. Not to enjoy His heaven, but to enjoy who He is from the inside out. <laughs> so I promise you love is a lot more free. <laughs> than selfishness and taking account of everybody's wrongs and needing people to pay up and ah, that is a wretched place to live guys who's ever had fun there it's keeping a track record of everything and trying to make everything right it doesn't work does it but if we walk in the light but if we walk in the light as He is in the light. That means if we come clean, come free from ourselves, get in true fellowship with Him, come out of the darkness into the light, right? Out of darkness into the light. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We're born again. We're the body of Christ. We're the people of God. What happens? The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from what? All sin. Done. Righteous. I'm not dual natured. I'm not driven by sin, desperately in need of the blood every day. Thank God that's the love of God that He knows my state. I'm always going to sin. Thank God He forgives me. I'm always going to sin. Thank God He forgives me. The, a lot of the church believes that. It's not true. I'm going to show you why it's not true. The Word tells you it's not true. Watch. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us what? all sin. Now watch. If we say we have no sin, you were just cleansed of all sin. Now he's not telling you to turn around and confess that you always have it. If you say you have no sin, what's he saying? In the context of what he's writing, he's saying if you say you have no need for this in your life, the cleansing through the blood. If he's saying I don't need to be born again, I, what do you mean sin? I'm a pretty good fella. I, I'm already walking the light. I'm not as bad as people are. If you're saying you have no need for a Savior, if you have no need for the blood to cleanse you, if you're saying you have no sin, we're deceived. You're deceived and the truth's not even in you. Do you know there's people trying to be saved by their works? There's people that say, well, I'm a pretty good person. They go to church. There's denominations that have been reduced to trying to be pretty good people and God's going to let me in heaven because I do pretty good. You get it? Now watch. If we confess our sins, I don't believe this is saying, look, we're always going to have sin. If we say we're not, we're deceived and we always have to keep confessing it. It's in light of everything he's writing. What he's saying is, this is my born-again experience. Now, I can still utilize this and understand that if I'm walking and I stumble and I go, whoa, and the light in my life re reveals that that, was in sin, that wasn't God, that was sin, or my mindset was selfish, and all of a sudden I get convicted that, man, 
That is so twisted. That is so not... Father, I thank you. That is not who I am and who I'm created to be. God and the light in my life exposed that. I, that is not me. And I have no desire in my life to be willful or selfish and, and touch somebody in a self-righteous place. God, thank you for illuminating me with truth and understanding, forgiving me and washing me of all sin. I thank you that I stay clean in your sight. I am mature and wiser and sharper because you love me and father me. Thanks for truth that's making me free. So in the midst of a misnomer and misconduct in my own motive or mind, I never lose a step in relationship. I actually grow and increase because His goodness keeps me changed. I don't go, oh, I can't believe I was thinking that. Why did I have that motive? And here I am preaching and traveling and saying I'm this and that and I am, not, I am such a hypocrite. Oh my God, I have issues I need healed on the inside. <laughs> forgive me <laughs> no I'm walking out and working out my salvation and above all reverencing God and if I see in my life anything less than him I step over here in a sanctified way and say father that is so not who I am in you you get it and I never sacrifice my identity now watch watch if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to what Forgive us our sins. He's not talking about in the next hour. He's talking about if you recognize your need for a Savior and that you've lived in a selfish, sinful manner driven by sin or selfishness, whatever you want to call it. He is faithful to just cleanse you. You come out of the darkness into the light and you walk in Him as He's in the light because His blood has cleansed you and it introduces you to family and now you have fellowship with one another. He's actually preaching righteousness here. And your born again experience. Watch. Here's how you know. If he's confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So once you're cleansed of all unrighteousness, guess what you forever are? Righteous. And if you let your identity be ruled by a sin you commit after you're saved, you're deceived. You'll be condemned in your mind. You won't face God. You'll hide from God. You'll put fig leaves on. And you'll become the product of your sin. Instead of embrace Him and enjoy His mercy and enjoy His love and let His goodness keep you transformed. You get it? Come on, this is a big deal. You have to see yourself continually righteous. In Christ, when are you ever unrighteous? When you fail to live by faith and receive His love then you'll live in a conscience that seems unrighteous, but through Christ, you're still made right in the sight of God. Isn't that amazing? He didn't just die for our sins. Chapter 2 says He died yet, but for the sins of the whole. People just don't realize it. But He already died. Oh, that's amazing. Now watch. If we confess our sin, He's faithful. He cleanses. If we say... Now he clarifies this and strengthens verse 7 and 8. If we say we have not sinned. In other words, he says, if we say we haven't sinned and have no need of the blood, that's what makes us deceived. Who knows that I had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and I needed the blood of Jesus? Who knows that I've made a couple mistakes since I've been born again? Who knows that I'm not a condemned man? Who knows that I've stayed righteous that whole time and received Father's love through it all and it's what made me love Him even more because His mercy and all that good stuff about Him. Right? Oh. Now watch. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His Word's not even in us. So if His Word's in us, we all have to recognize our own ability to fail apart from Him. We all have to recognize that we all need the blood of Jesus, that he died once for all, and that every man needs him. Right? Now watch. My little children, these things I write to you. Why is he writing this to us? So we don't sin. So he's certainly not saying you're always gonna, three verses before. <laughs> the whole reason he's writing is so you don't sin. Or here's what he's saying. My little children, I write these things to you so that you do not sin. But don't dare think that you're not going to sin or you're whacked and deceived and truth's not even in you. But the reason I'm writing is so you don't, but you're always going <laughs> to. See how 
wretched we we can can make these one-liners in their interpretation it's damaging it's terrible horrible one-liners you pull a one-liner out of the bible and make it say what it sounds like it's saying without understanding it in its context is detrimental and damaging a one-liner to where the devil uses that one-liner to where you can't even preach righteousness and freed from sin because if you say you don't have sin you're deceived and you make God a liar that's a pretty heavy rap so now the person that's preaching righteousness the psalmist says I haven't failed to preach righteousness in all the congregation righteousness preaching all of a sudden people draw back from preaching righteousness seek his kingdom and his righteousness all of a sudden we can't even preach righteousness because if we say we have no sin we're deceived and the truth's not in us now we're some kind of antichrist or something and he's the son of righteousness with healing in his wings <laughs> and now we interpret the Bible to where we can't even preach the truth so the truth can't make us free so we do religious duty and we build buildings and pay homage to God instead of become like God oh I'm preaching so good <laughs> you guys are right <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> watch if we say we have not sinned my little children these things I'll write to you so you do not sin watch this it doesn't say but when it says an if he doesn't even want you thinking sin see he just erased sin consciousness sin mentality sin identity in this whole chapter and we've reduced it in shallow understanding we've reduced it to saying we always have sin and haven't even understood the Spirit of God in writing. <gasps> you follow me? He didn't say when. He said and if anyone sins. Why? He doesn't even want you thinking sin. But if it happens, know this. It's the end of the world and you are damned and judged to eternal hell. Oh, it doesn't even say that. <laughs> wait a minute. No, i got to read here. Wait, wait, whoa. Hey. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate. He's with the Father. He's Jesus Christ, the righteous. Oh. <laughs> Do you see how powerful the Word of God is? <laughs> Who is He? Oh, He's not just Jesus Christ. He's Jesus Christ, the righteous. And if I'm in Him and He's in me and I'm the body of Christ, I must be righteous too. Because if there's light in Him and no darkness and He's in me, there must be light in me. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> or you can be spiritually schizophrenic and be a whole bunch of different things <laughs> or you can be one in him Brian hang on Sue's bringing you the mic thanks Sue when you were talking about the word in us all I kept hearing is, uh, is in John 15 where it says you're already clean because of the word that Bam. I've spoken to you. It's just done. John 15. It's so powerful. You are clean because I've spoken. Why? Because he's truth. And, and he can't change. They're excellent. There's no turning or shifting of shadow. So if he says, I love you, guess what you are? If he says, I forgive you, guess what you are? Oh, if he says, you're righteous, guess what you are? If he says, you're worthy of my coming and your life carries enough value to warrant my death, guess what your life is? Worthy of living. Period. Because he's already spoken. Hebrews 1 says, in times past, God spoke to the fathers through the prophets, but in these last days, God has spoken through his Son. <laughs> And it's the word of righteousness. Amen? So we seek first his kingdom which is in us. It's not somewhere here. It's in us and all his righteousness. And now the door is open for all these things to be added. That means everything necessary to fulfill his will and to manifest his glory. It doesn't just mean full vats and full barns and every wish and want fulfilled. It means everything necessary to do what you're on the planet for. Isn't that cool? Now watch, I want, you, I want you to see this one little point here yet. This next verse, and it says, We have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And look, and He Himself. That's why you have to keep your eyes on Him and know who you are through Him. That's why He is the big deal. He Himself is the mercy seat 
for your sins, the propitiation, the mercy over your sins, and not for ours only. Isn't this amazing? And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's why unbelievers can be healed right now. That's why people that aren't born again can be healed because there's mercy crying out towards them and God will grant them that mercy so His goodness can bring them to change. Yeah. You get it? If you say, well, you can't get healed if you're not a believer, well, that's, well, that's absolutely unscriptural. In fact, scripturally, in Jesus' day, everybody he healed wasn't born again because he didn't even die and shed his blood yet and they were under the law of sin and death. Yep. So everyone was sin conscious and nobody was saved. Right. Right. Yeah. And a couple got healed more than if they were written one by one. The world wouldn't contain the books, whatever that means. What I believe that means is the books of that day wouldn't have been able to hold the one by one written miracles of Jesus Christ. The books of his day in a three year period, if they were written one by one, wouldn't have been able to contain the acts of love and righteousness and the acts of mercy of Jesus Christ. So he had a pretty eventful three years. And not one of them was born again. Almost all of them didn't understand nor believe. And even his own disciple, a long ways into it, realized, Oh my God, you're the Christ. And even though he realized that and had that revelation, he still loved his own life and didn't know how to not love his own life. He wasn't even born again. He didn't even have the Spirit of God. But in his integrity and commitment, he's sure he was ready to die for him. He even took a good swing with a sword one day and chopped off the ear of a aggressor. But when he was really faced with the reality of death, guess what he did? He denied him, but guess what he had? A revelation that he was the Christ. But he still what? Denied. Jesus knew all that ahead of time and prayed. Prayed for him. Satan has asked that you be sifted like wheat, but I have prayed for you. That means, all that means, it doesn't mean Satan's there with a permission slip from God to go hammer Peter. What it means, he has a strategy set against him to crush him and destroy him and uproot everything Jesus sowed into him. You are not going to get sifted, but I have prayed for you. Guess who makes mediation and intercession for you daily? <laughs> Guess who pleads your righteous case to the Father every moment of every day? Guess who pleads why you deserve mercy every day before the throne? He says to Peter, listen, but I have prayed for you. <laughs> it's either confident or arrogant. I think it was confident. <laughs> he told Peter, when you return, which means he saw Peter wander away in fear. He saw Peter overwhelmed with sorrow. He saw Peter feeling condemned and unworthy. You might be amazed to find out he might have had the same temptation to Judas. He might have thought of just dying. He might have felt the same, same betrayal. Well, I didn't sell him out for 30 pieces of silver, but I sold him out. I loved my own life. I wasn't there for the master. When the shepherd was struck, the sheep sure scattered. And I said I would die for him. What a blasphemer, what a hypocrite, what a liar I am. You can't even imagine the horror of his soul in that moment. And yet Jesus said, when you return to your brethren, so he already prophesied and proclaimed him back. He saw that little season, had prayed, had spent time for the ones he loved, and he saw this stuff working out, and he had sealed him in a place of prayer. And he even told Peter, when you return, strengthen your brethren. Why? Because he's going to have some hard-learned lessons under his belt, but lessons nonetheless. He's going to know some things and understand some things about the Master and look what God raised him up to be in the church. And the world could remember him as one that denied, one that wasn't there, weak, spine, whatever. But a few chapters later in the book of Acts, you see him looking at the very Sanhedrin that set up Jesus. And he says, whether it's right to listen to you or God, you need to be the judge. <laughs> but I can't help but open my mouth and preach. Right? So he got past that whole loving of his own life and the whole death and all that thing, didn't he? See? So he grew up into him in all things. Why? Because God's mercy never fails. God's love never fails. So God didn't mark Peter for what he did. God marked Peter for what Jesus did. And what Jesus did brought Peter through the eye of that needle into that everlasting life and the expression of that change. 
<laughs> oh man, that is so good. <laughs> I need I need to get this tape. <laughs> It's just fun. I, I, I'm on a journey every time when I'm just preaching. I'm thinking, this is, I feel like I'm being taught when I'm teaching. Oh, it's just, I so enjoy it. Like, you, you know, this isn't like, oh, I just feel it so fresh. I was laying in a hotel room one morning. My buddy Todd White was laying there. He was snoring loud. It was five in the morning. I opened my eyes and I was wide awake. It's fun rooming with him. When he was first growing his, growing his dreads, they were sticking out everywhere. And he'd sit up in the middle of the night and the window would be in the hotel and you could see his silhouette through the light. And it looked like the Greek goddess or something, Medusa. Medusa came into your bedroom to devour. And there's Todd. And he was a big boy back then. He didn't even lose all that weight yet. He was just a big boy. And he's sitting there and his, it looked like snakes on somebody's head in the middle of the night. And, and he's talking and groaning and grumbling sometimes. And, and he's just having dreams. And I think he's fighting the devil. And one night I looked over and he was praying for a lady in his sleep in the sick. That was sick in his sleep. And he had his snakes in his head. And I looked over and he's like, it's okay, ma'am. No, Jesus really loves you. No, just hold on. Just hold on. In Jesus' name, be healed. And he's, and he's boom, lays right back down to sleep. It's, it's eventful. But, but this morning, this, this particular morning, I'm laying there and I woke up and we didn't go to bed till 1.30. It's, it's conference stuff. We're, we're out. We're talking. We're in the room. We, we're glad to be together because we don't even see each other anymore. And hey, none of you went, oh, that was good. But, uh, I woke up and Holy Spirit said, hey. I said, yeah. He said, let's go take a run together. It's five in the morning. It's pitch dark. We're in a hotel that's right outside of a country road and it's dark, dark. There's no street light. And it's five in the morning. And I said, and I went to bed at 1.30. He said, you want to run? And it was like somebody like that, that whole giddy thing you see. You know, can I have this dance, you know? I'm like, he said, he asked me to go run with him. And I'm like... I'm getting my shorts. <laughs> and I'm sneaking and I'm trying not to wake up Todd and I slip on my running stuff. And I'm like, let's go. And I'm just running down the road. We're running. I, I had a, I had a tr uh, course mar marked out on this country road with a rental car. For, oh, I actually had my truck. Yeah, I had my own car. We, I marked a two and a half mile stretch so that I'd run down and back and be five miles. So I knew the stop sign I needed to run to. It's five in the morning. It's pitch dark. I'm running. And I'm like, this is awesome. I feel so energized. Just the fact that you asked me to run this morning is like so intimate. It's so cool. I mean, what a, who cares if it's five? I'm running with God. It's like, so. And all of a sudden, he began to preach to me the revelation of the blood and the finished work of the cross. Uh, it, it, overwhelming stuff like that. Experiences. I'm running down the road yelling on this country road at five minutes going, yes, Jesus. And I'm running. I got back to the hotel five miles. I got back to the hotel. It was like 26 minutes. I was back into the hotel, 28 minutes. I'm in the hotel. That's like under six minute miles. And I'm like, the blood, yeah, vindicated. I get in the shower. I'm laying in my bed. I can't possibly sleep. Yeah. Todd's over there. <laughs> now, it's not to make him less spiritual or anything. It's just a funny story. <laughs> he's over there, and he's sleeping, and I'm laying there, and I'm like... And he always tells me to get him up at a certain time. And he said, because, you know, you got that relationship thing going, and don't use the alarm, so I'll just set my phone. I said, why don't you just get the re uh, relationship thing going? Dude, you already got it going. He wakes you up, man. Just get me up, and he'll laugh. <laughs> go to bed because I'd never use an alarm clock even when I'm traveling if I have to get up early to catch a flight or anything I just ask Holy Spirit wake me up I'd rather wake up to you than any other noise and he, he wakes me up all the time I'd never use an alarm clock 16 years and, and it doesn't matter and I have an amazing schedule sometimes but I know I'll be up because he wakes me up he doesn't slumber He's, I, I picture him sitting over my bed excited for me to get up <laughs> You know what time I need to get up. You know when it's healthy to get up. Even if I don't have a schedule, you know when I need to be up. That way, every time I wake up, I wake up to Him. Yeah. I don't wake up to... Bah, bah, bah. <laughs> and then my soul go, Oh, no, 5.30. Oh, why couldn't it be 4.30? 
No, I wake up to Him. This is something I've done. First couple times I did it, I think. I know the first night I set my alarm. Not in unbelief, just because I didn't even know if this was a legitimate request. But I said, I'm just going to set my alarm because I'm not even sure because you're not my bellboy, my busboy. You're not my servant. You're my friend. And you're God, the Holy Spirit. But if this is a reasonable thing, I'd rather wake up to you. And I set my alarm just in case. This wasn't a viable request. And a minute before it was going to go off, I opened my eyes and the presence of God rolled over me. I went, oh, and I hit off the alarm button. And then my first conscious is, that was 15 and a half years ago. It's been that way ever since. So Todd tells me to get him up. He says, because I know you'll be up. So he says, get me up. So it's 730. He wants up. So I said, hey, buddy. Hey, Todd. It's time to get up. You know, he rolls over. Huh? He said, okay, you, you want to get a shower? I'll get a shower. I said, man, you can get a shower. I already got my shower. What? Wait, what? And he sits up. What? I said, man, I am wide awake. I said, I had the most amazing. I was overwhelmed. I wanted to cry. I said, Holy Spirit got me up at five. You were laying there snoring. It's just the way it came out of me. I didn't even, I wasn't even being silly with him. I said, you were laying there snoring and I was listening to you. I was kind of chuckling and Holy Spirit came on me and said, let's go run. He said, oh, oh, okay, I'm snoring. So you and Holy Spirit leave me and just go take a run because I'm snoring. I said, well, yeah, well, he couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. We might as well go and leave you here. You know, why should he tolerate that? I mean, I just had so much fun with him. He's like, oh, that's just wrong, dude. That's just wrong. And I said, just go get cleaned up. Go get a shower, man. Maybe you'll smell better in a minute. Just <laughs> so he got in the shower. But it was just fun. It was just fun. So, uh, amen. Uh, you guys getting something out of this? You really are? Good. Because, I, I mean, it's Thursday and I feel like, oh my goodness, I wanted to get so much farther. But we covered a lot more than righteousness, didn't we? Huh? We did? <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> we're we're going to, I'm not going to take you into any more right now. We're going to, we're going to nail something else down though, I'm sure next week, because it seems to be the punchline of it all, like the knot, you know what I mean, or the bow or whatever. And what I really feel in my heart, and we'll see, it's school. What I really feel in my heart is next week, so if you can be here and you're, you know, scheduled to be here, of course, you'll hear, but... You know, I, I hope you can make it. Uh, so we're really going to talk about fellowship and communion with God and the intimacy with God and what that looks like. How important it is to get to know Him and build God reality in your own life. And how you get there by faith and how faith becomes your reality. And how it's such an encouraging journey and how many little stumbling blocks come in your soul and ways of thinking that try to pull the plug on that beautiful process of growing in Him. You follow me? Because intellect and natural reasoning pulls the plug if we allow it. But you can live by faith, can't you? And faith can become your reality, can't it? And we're going to camp there next week. Because I, I honestly believe, and this might sound like an overstatement or a strong statement, it's a little risky to talk like this. It's my personal belief, though. I honestly believe that what we at large in the body of Christ are lacking is God reality. God reality changes everything. You, you don't struggle with things that you think you struggle with when God reality rises to a certain level. There are certain desires that you don't even have to kill or quench or fast away. They just disappear in the light of Him. There's, there's a place that God reality carries you and takes you that is effortless. It's the joy of knowing Him. You follow me? It's just good. And I understand, you know, you can say, well, God was in fellowship with Adam. He's walking, he still ate the tree. I understand. That's why we have mercy and provision, but we're not even thinking eating the tree. We're thinking walking in the cool of the day. What the church has been this evening to do and is focusing on not eating the tree. No, if you're walking in the cool of the day with Him, you're not in the tree. You're not eating the tree. We're trying not to eat the tree. We're trying not to follow the voice. No, just walk with Jesus. <laughs> Oh, you see how simple this is? See, it would take a guy like me to have to preach this way because this thing is not deep. It is like simple. If it wasn't simple, I couldn't get it. I am so un uneducated. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Serious. I, I am like, I don't, I don't, I, I am very uneducated man. And I'm not against people that are intellectual. I think it's amazing. 
But this thing is simple. Don't be removed from the simplicity that's in Christ and be wise in your own opinion. Okay? I'm just going to close. Yeah, there is... Uh, there, there's, I'll just point you this way, right here. I'm going to do it this way. Uh, these two, Anthony and Jenny, are sitting here. They, they, they're working with a young lady that is just looking for some change in her life, getting things on track. Single mama has some things she really has to get done, some things she has to get in order administratively over her life, moving from a relationship, wanting to make the right choices, move in the right direction, has three children, and just needs some help right now with some transportation to get her to to the place she needs to be to do some of these things she needs to do administratively, help her with the children a little. And there's an important, critical time frame and season right now in her life that she just, so if you, you know, I don't know, you know, you're in the school, I don't know where your time is, if you're just hanging out, if, you're, if there's any way you feel like you can help this young lady, you know, with transportation, just watching over kids while she's doing some of these important things. I don't even know if you'd call them legal things as much as just administrative and to get a ball rolling in certain areas. Uh, that would be a major blessing right now. She's, uh, they've been doing what they can and at the same time, th their time only permits a certain amount of grace and time and you all understand that. So that's what makes family family if we can pitch in in some way and just try to help her. That doesn't compel or mandate you in a wrong way if you're available. That would be amazing to just offer some time for so just a ride, get to know her. What I found about these things is you get to know the person. You're not just doing a favor. Your heart gets involved. You begin to pray for them. You get to encourage them. You get to know somebody as they're taking steps toward truth. And you enjoy the whole process. At least I do because I've been in a few thousand of those situations. <laughs> and I'm a pretty happy guy because of it. Because you get to enjoy that whole process. So, uh, if if you in any way feel like you know you want to feel out what that looks like, what that involves, and if you might qualify time wise and stuff like that, see them immediately after we pray. Okay. And what's your name again back here? Terry. Terry's back there. He's had a replacement, knee replacement. It's not doing real well right now. It's hurting him. It's been aching him. So I want a couple of you guys, students in this place, that just take like two guys. That you know Jesus is Lord, loves Terry and heals, to run back there and pray for him. Would you do that? Two guys. Good. And if anybody else in here needs prayer as a family for anything, physical, anything, uh, begin to ask and talk and don't just wait for it to happen in a service setting or a school setting. Like I had young ladies. What's up, honey? Oh, okay. Grab, grab someone that you see Christ in, respect. Just grab this young lady right here because I see Christ in her. And you just get her to pray and agree for Mary. But if you get in, in, in here and you need prayer for something in your own body, uh, Linda, raise your hand high. Just, yeah, raise your hand high. I want like two ladies when we end here in prayer. Not right now. You don't have to leap up. That was fine. Hey, that was cool. But just to come over and introduce yourself to her and just love her and just pray God's blessing and grace upon her that her mind would be still, her heart be still, that this truth would get into her and just you bless her. Speak life over her, okay? Because, there, there, I, and I'm not saying that to exploit anything negative in her. I'm saying that because there's things that try to keep us from getting where our heart is pointing. True? And I believe it would be healthy. I believe Linda could be loved right now by somebody and just encouraged and somebody wrap your arm around her. Miss Vicky, you're on my heart. I don't like to appoint people, but you're really on my heart. If you would be able to just, maybe both of you, just at some point here real soon, just come over and just, just love her and pray for her. Just bless her. You don't even have to tell them anything, Linda. Don't even tell them anything. Just let them pray over you. And you just bless her and speak grace over her life and just love on her. Okay? It'll be good. Just love her. You're so lovable. If you weren't lovable, Jesus would have never hung on the cross. He just said he died once for all except for Linda. Yeah. It doesn't say that. I never found that. I didn't find that in the Greek or anything. It, it says he died once for all. It doesn't say anything about accepting Linda except for Linda. So, Father, we thank you right now for your amazing love. Thank you for the identity we receive through Christ. And thank you that this word is true. It's the word of righteousness. It's Jesus Christ, the righteous. <laughs> thank you that that's who we've become through your sacrifice. Build integrity in us. Grant understanding. Let the lights come on, Lord. 
in all of our hearts and thank you for what you're doing in us. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Bless you guys. That is a miracle. We're like seven minutes early. But that, that gives you a chance to just love on somebody. Bless somebody.